Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the capstone presentations for our BXA graduating seniors. Um, we are running all day long. <laughs> so we'll be here from nine till noon Eastern time and then back at three um, for our afternoon presentations. So our first today is from Melania Heifetz and she has a video that I'm going to share. Um, Melania, do you want, Milana, do you want to uh, introduce this or? Yeah, uh, okay. thank you Thanks so much. You. Um, my project is about combining both of the disciplines that I'm studying, both music, concentrating in violin, as well as global systems and management. So there's a performance side as well as an analytical side to be able to combine my last four years at CMU. Excellent, thank you very much. I will share my screen and we will play this video. Good morning, everybody. My name is Milana Heifetz, and I'm really excited to share my capstone project with you guys today, Music Within the German Language. Brief introduction on me. I'm a senior studying an interdisciplinary degree with music, concentrating in violin performance and global systems and management. I wanna say a special thank you to my advisor for helping me out with this project, Dennis Scaletti, as well as BXA, specifically Professor Murray, for helping me in the past four years. An overview of what I'll be discussing today is the main idea of my capstone project and why it was interesting to me. And then I will talk about the logistics and process that I went through, as well as the analysis and findings. Lastly, I will wrap it up with my own conclusion from it. So first, a bit of background information on the project. Germans have been a very important influence on classical music for centuries. It has affected musical styles and has contributed to many different innovations that we just take for granted. And German speaking countries have always had a huge influx of some of the world's greatest composers like Handel, Bach and Beethoven, Mozart and Mendelssohn, just to name a few. And because I'm located in Vienna, Austria, I was interested in studying the German language and learning pieces with music from only German speaking composers. The goal was to see if the German language and culture affects their music and how the composers created their own language by utilizing nuances that was found in the German language. I find this important because I have played German classical music in the past. However, the main critique I would get from professors was that my style was not matching the composer's intentions. And the intention comes from the composer's language and culture. And I want to better understand that relationship so I can be a better musician. And being located in Vienna, which is the classical music capital of the world, I just wanted to take advantage of the place and the people for this project. So getting into the logistics of it, I chose three different pieces, the first being Bach Partita number no. two in D minor, second Beethoven Sonata number no. five in F major, just commonly referred to as the Spring Sonata, and then the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto in E minor. So all of these are by German composers. Beethoven spent most of his life in Vienna, but they're all from different time periods in classical music. So Bach is from the Baroque period, Beethoven was between the classical and romantic period in music, and Mendelssohn was in the romantic period of music. So I think it was a good sample size so that it wouldn't be biased only from one time period in the German classical music history. And the process was, I took private German lessons to be able to better understand the German language and to hear those nuances better. I went to several Beethoven exhibits as it is his 250th birthday this year. And it's a really big celebration in the music community. And I went to the Mozart Museum and several Baroque concerts here in Vienna. I also supplemented this research with additional academic sources I found either in the library or online. Now, 
Now to get into the analysis of it. So I first started to look for a connection between the German language and the music. And that connection was actually not as strong as I expected it to be. So I will show you one of the examples I pulled from. This is, for instance, the Beethoven Spring Sonata, which you'll be hearing later in the presentation. And this is very melodic lines, but that's very a contrast to the German language. So a lot of German words have a very harsh sounding ch sound because especially they speak a lot from the back of the throat and they make this ach sound. And a lot of their words in German start in sh and it makes this very over pronounced, we would say, sound with all their syllables and the emphasis that they put on every syllable. But this excerpt here from Beethoven is just the opposite of that. It is supposed to be played with a very light touch. Every note is not supposed to be emphasized. The notes that are only supposed to be emphasized are the ones at the beginning of every measure. And if anything, this work can be compared to an Italian composer named Antonio Rossini. And Antonio Rossini was in the same time period as Beethoven. And they both had the similarity of doing a long steady building of sound over a phrase of music. So having a really delicate and gradual sound and something that you don't really hear in the nuances of the German language. But a correlation that was a lot stronger in the research was the correlation between the German culture and their music. So this is one of the examples I pulled to show you today from the Bach Partita number no. two in D minor. A little bit of background of Bach. He wrote a lot of church cantatas and some of his best compositions were when he worked for the prince in Germany at the time. And so the prince at the time did not want very opulent music, but he wanted music that was religious and humbling um, to God. And so in Bach's music, you really hear the German culture. You hear this strong respect for rules, authority, clarity, precision, but at the same time, it has this opulence, but with a sense of humility to it. And this comes from the religious context that it was played in. And you can see this from a musical perspective from the repeats that he has. So every few lines repeat themselves. They're overemphasized in the sense that there's a lot of order and structure to them. The way he places the cadences and the dynamics, very structured and very by the rules and by the books, as well as the fact the way he has his nuances with his major whole steps and half steps, as well as the key that he puts his music in, which makes it very structured in nature. And this is something that you can see with all three composers, is that there is this sense of opulence, but humility, because all of three of these composers were working for royalties in their respective times. So there is this respect for higher society and for this clean cut sound, but at the same time, it has to be humbling in experience to listen to it because at the time in all three of those periods, religion was a huge part of everyone's life. And so the honor that they had for God and the way they expressed that you can also see within the music. I think through this project, I came in with the assumption of this quote that I always heard was that to better understand a culture, you have to better understand the language. And I think there is some validity in that. But for this specific research, and I think with music, it's more important to emphasize the culture, where this composer was from, when did he live, what was going on in his life, because at the end of the day, music has a purpose, and that purpose comes from the intentions, and so every one of these composers was writing in a specific context, in a specific place, and I think being located in Vienna, Austria, really helped me grasp grasp the cultural aspect of that by being and walking and living in the same place where Mozart and Beethoven had their lives. And with that, I would like to play you some excerpts from this. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening and I'd love to open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Milana. That was great. Um, I am just, oh, sorry, just popping over <clears throat> to our live stream on YouTube to see if there are any questions, if anybody listening, watching um, would like to uh, throw questions into those comments, I will relay them over our chat. Um, one question I have for you is, uh, do you feel like, do you feel like you gained more engagement with the, with your, with the music in your performance of it through this research? Do you feel like that had an effect on your, on your playing, on your musicianship? I think definitely. So I think a lot when it comes to musicality, um, professors always ask you to interpret and to, okay, that you have to imagine this kind of scenario. And I, it, I didn't have to imagine it because I was here and I would go to the church where Mozart was married in or where he would eat or what his life was like. And so kind of breathing in that place, I was able, I think, to express that better, you know, like I, I knew what it meant or I knew what he was going through. I knew what the royalty was like or where he was playing that music. Um, so I think it for sure made an impact. Excellent. Cool. Um, all right. Well, that takes us to 915. So you hit it on the nose. Thank you so much um, for sharing your research with us um, and from jo for joining us from Vienna. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day, even though there's not a whole lot of it. Um, Thank you. And now we will move on to Maggie Caballero. Maggie, are you ready to go? So yeah, I'm just about to pull up the file. Since I have it on R, I have to like knit it into the HTML document I have. And then I can share my screen. And we'll yeah, you good. should be able to share your screen. All right, it's done loading. Okay. All right, is that good? Yep, looks good. Okay. I'm just, okay, I just need to make sure I could scroll. <laughs> um, so yeah. Good morning, my name is Maggie Cavallero. And so for my project, I will be presenting a sort of amalgamation of forecasts I ran on um, some arts data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis using a whole combination of my skills um, that I've garnered in data science, economics, and statistics um, through my last Two years where I, um, at CMU where I started focusing more on like statistics and data science stuff and this project was how I was able to combine that with um, my arts concentration. So yeah, as a student who has been playing violin my entire life and also been participating in STEM, a line is all, I've always really heard from people is that either like the job prospects are slim or that the arts are not getting enough funding. Um, it's always something that's been in my ear constantly, especially since also my senior year, the Pittsburgh Symphony went on strike. Um, and so my life was kind of in a really weird way, deeply affected by this general topic. Um, with the exception of the Pittsburgh Symphony going on strike, uh, these claims have never really been substantiated to me. Um, no one's actually come up with numbers that are very, very, like hardcore to me, I guess in my brain, um, like none of the music programs around my area were cut in like terms of like the middle schools or high schools, like I've heard in other areas. Um, and so I was just wondering if it, if there is like a national economic trend going on or if my vision of things is distorted, especially since I've sort of been on both sides of the coin, STEM and the arts. Um, so this project is me investigating if, what I've been told is actually reality. So um, to 
for the data set I used, I was considering using a bunch of different data sets. However, I ended up actually focusing on one particular data set, mainly because, um, I mean, using government data sets is actually a really, some of the nicest data sets you'll ever use. They're really well organized. They um, are very easy to access. And so um, when trying to piece data sets together, I happened upon the ACPSA data set, which was the data I noticed that was being used and cited the most by different websites. Um, it stands for Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account, and it's through the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And so what I found to be particularly useful about this data set was on top of just having really detailed and clean data. Um, it also helped me put different arts professions into categories. That was something I was struggling with at the beginning of this project because there's just so many different fields and so many different applications of art. And this data set divided it beautifully into core arts and cultural production and supporting arts and cultural production. So core arts were what like the performing arts, museums, um, like design services, which meant like interior design, graphic design, industrial design, fine arts education, and arts educational services. And then underneath this, these subcategories of the core arts category, um, there was also symphonies, theater, they showed the graphic design stuff, or like um, there was tons of different information about different subcategories about this stuff. Um, and so for the sake of this infographic, um, this, it would literally be an, an endless page if I examined all of it, even though I do, I did examine all of the information because there's only about like 22 subcategories um, to go through, which if you've worked with large data is actually really, really small. Um, and, the, uh, and so, um, but the long, in the longer, more complete report, they will like, look into more granular categories. Um, and so, and then, in addition to the core art stuff, um, just a side note, because the supporting arts and cultural production part of the data set is not going to be included in this report. However, um, I did think they were interesting um, categories to include because some of them were not fields. Um, they weren't like the core art stuff, like they weren't, they were fields that also they applied to the arts, but also to other um, like fields beyond that. And they were useful in terms of using them as supporting evidence for some of my models, but that like, if I wanted to include different variables and different models, they were really useful to elaborate on like why a trend might be happening and things like that. Um, so for the forecasting methods that I used in this project um, vastly were the auto regression forecast. So this at its most basic definition is forecasting based on past data. Um, so, I really like this forecasting method um, because you can adjust the amount of past data you focus on really, really easily. And also it's very easy like to sort of figure out how accurate the forecast is for this one, which is just the whole fight basically. You're trying to figure out how accurate it's gonna be. Um, so the tactic that you can use to figure out how accurate it has been in the past is a, uh, a technique called cross-validation, where you essentially like pretend you're in the past and you eliminate the most recent data entries and you then pretend sort of that you're trying to figure out what those would be with the techniques you're using. And so then you can once you've used those forecasting methods to pretend like, oh, I want to see like the data in like 2019, what it will be in like 2019, you can calculate it and then you can compare it to like the actual 2019 data value. And so I found that to be really, really useful. Um, this will, that's also not going to be in this infographic, but I do think this is really important premise to give just so there's a general understanding of what's going to be even going on um, in these forecasts and stuff, um, just these plots and stuff are really, really long. And so, yeah, it this infographic would not be readable um, if I had included them, but it's really, it's been 
useful in terms of assessing the accuracy of these forecasts. So the categories that I focus on in terms of like, so I focus on the, I have my arts category that I'm focusing on. And then this arts category um, stems across a bunch of economic data in this data set. Um, so the categories I decided to focus on for that were employment. So how many jobs are in the market currently? And then household consumption. Um, so like, how are people interacting with arts? How many people are buying X ticket or how many people are buying Y ticket? How much money are people putting into this market? And then um, three was macroeconomic analysis. So that was gonna be value added, which is basically an assessment of output, but minus the intermediate goods. So it's more assessing how much real money are these industries generating as in like how much money are they able to work with after they've been like spent X amount of their budget on production and stuff. So um, for the employment analysis, how many people are getting hired and how much job growth is going on? Um, this looks like a good plot, but unfortunately that's a consequence of just a concentrated view on this specific line. However, if you look, um, the volumes of like jobs in the arts have only increased by about 1.5 million, which then when you break it down over the 21 years this data exists, um, it's only a 1.2% increase per year in the jobs available, which is way beneath the amount of students entering the job market, way beneath the amount of people who might be like laid off. It's not a fantastic number to have, especially for all of the performing arts and all of the design people and all of the, like quite literally everybody in the core arts like this data set says. And then I have a decomposition of the fields that like are within this category. And we can definitely see immediately um, that for basically 21 years, many, many of these categories are essentially a flat line. Like even the performing arts category, even though it looks like it has an uptick, um, does not really go up that much. And then design has had some volatile growth. And if you look into the subcategories, this is largely caused by, um, this like huge spike is largely caused by like graphic design and computer design and stuff like that. Um, I will, for the sake of time, scroll down more to show you guys my forecasting methods. Um, since a lot of this stuff is more nitty gritty statistic stuff, so this is showing how I chose different forecasting methods um, and showing like these are different error metrics. I picked the lowest one to then figure out which method I was gonna use. Um, and so for looking at the overall like forecast for the core arts, like the everything, um, it did basically do exactly what I expected it would do. It showed with not that much error because this um, like the purple thing surrounding it is the confidence intervals. Um, so it shows that it's either gonna remain pretty stagnant, increase a little or decrease a little, um, nothing too promising. But something that I noticed then when I was looking so then moving on towards consumption was that consumption is actually not an issue at all. People are spending money on this stuff. Um, so it's a strange dichotomy of that. It's, there's a shortage of jobs, but not of money. Um, and in fact, the amount of money flowing into this field makes up 4% of the entire United States GDP. It is, a trillion dollar industry if you add in these supporting stuff too. Um, this is just examining the core. So this created a common thread of just why this is happening. Because again, like with the performing arts issue of there not being many jobs, they have no shortage of money. This is $20 billion uh, it, that they're generating. And it when I looked into the subcategories, um, they're, it seemed to be largely a lot from like theater, like Broadway is like a $1 billion industry, but it's still indicated that there is a definitely an imbalance. Cause also I'm 
if I were to look at like the microeconomic data, like seeing how many people were actually getting this, their hands on this money, it's n- not many. Um, the like the actual dispersion of money among the populace in this field is definitely incredibly imbalanced as well. Um, so I do think this is something worth investigating because then also my forecast showed that they're going to keep making tons of money. Like they could very well be like the household consumption of like arts products is going to be completely fine. Um, And so moving on to just then observing the output, like I touched on before about how truly this industry puts so much money into the world. Um, that my graph wouldn't even give me the number with zeros after it just um, showed me the value added. Uh, This, like the core arts and cultural production value added is enormous and is actually having a really healthy growth rate um, along with like design services are doing well. Um, The fine, like the only one I could really find that was emulating some level of like having financial issues was like fine arts education but even then in terms of like proportion like how well it was doing proportionally it was still fine so I honestly did end this project with more questions than answers but also I did get some answers because I was wondering like is this true or not and it sort of turned out to be yes and no so like there's no jobs but there's tons and tons and tons of money present here Um, And so I think that's the part of this, like, worth investigating more. Um, Just how did this dichotomy even happen? Like, why is there that rhetoric that the arts are dying, but it's close to a trillion dollar industry? So, yeah, Um, I know I got really close to 930. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but yeah. So thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Maggie. That was fascinating. That's really interesting about um, how much money there is in it. And yeah, I, I hope you can continue on um, sort of examining that Wednesday, and figuring out. May 12th. I'm sorry, my alarm is off. 9.29 a.m. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, figuring out where that money's going and is there a way to, to reroute it back into... Yeah um jobs that's really interesting um thank you very much uh we are going to move on now to let me look at my schedule rain do whose title i lost but she will tell us um so rain do you want to introduce your video um yeah sure um sorry the lighting is not great here where i am um but anyway um my my capstone project is called lumaland um it's a small puzzle game. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, the pre-recorded video will introduce it more, but basically it started out as a summer project, but it ran way over. Um, had a lot of fun on it. Um, yeah, I have the recorded presentation. So um, I guess you can play that. All right, I will do that right now. Hello, I'm Rain, a CMU Bachelor of Computer Science and Art student class of 2021. My BXA capstone project is called Lumiland. It's a 3D block pushing puzzle game made with Unity. It was advised and sponsored by Professor Jim McCann or Teachow LLC. I worked on the game's mechanics and level design, art, and programming. Other developers of this game include Professor Jim McCann on programming, level designer Emma Popham, and sound designer and composer Xiuan Suerhezi. Lumalan has two controllable characters, light and shadow. In every level, the player starts by controlling light, navigating through the levels, pushing around the pushable blocks when necessary, until they eventually reach the goal crystal. In some levels, players can temporarily switch to control shadow instead, who has some useful abilities such as seeing and walking in shadow, but as a trade-off, they cannot take more than a few steps in the sunlight, or they'll die. However, players need to switch back to light to reach the goal and advance to a new level. There is no effect when shadow touches the goal. The game's levels are designed to challenge players to make use of the two characters' unique abilities and let them collaborate to solve the puzzles. The 58 levels are placed on branching paths. Players start on the main path, which includes 31 easy to medium difficulty levels. 
Since the game has no text explanation to the mechanics, the levels on the main path also serve as introduction to the mechanics. As players progress through the main path, they unlock paths containing a total of 27 optional levels. These levels, mostly designed by Emma, are not only more challenging, but also explore the narrative potential of the mechanics and often stage the two characters in such a way that, hopefully, invite players to think about the game's true theme behind Light and Shadow, which is the relationship between them, and what it means for Light's success to be built upon the selfless support or even sacrifice of Shadow. In addition to the built-in levels, Professor Jim McCann also wrote a web-based level editor and the level sharing website so players can create, import, and share custom levels with each other. With a tiny art department, namely just me, I developed this art style to make sure the game looks pretty, but not too demanding on assets. There are five sets of environment assets in total, each with a different theme and roughly corresponds to one mechanics variation. To render them, each object is shaded with a flat color with an opacity texture to let me control the contour more precisely such as for grass blades and trees. There's an additional hand-painted texture that stores the object's facing information, and I use that information to calculate lighting. To be consistent with the game's mechanics, I added thick volumetric shadow to light's point of view to indicate that they cannot walk into shadow, and added thin volumetric light to shadow's point of view to indicate that sunlight is harmful. To implement both volumetric effects, I use cube meshes to represent the volumes, then use a render buffer to first accumulate the distances to all the back faces of these meshes, subtracted by the distances to all the front faces to get the volume thickness at each pixel, then finally transform the volume thickness into translucent colors. If the camera is inside the volumetric shadow, the volume that includes the camera renders with only 30% of its usual opacity to still allow the player to see the outside environment. I took the character design from a series of drawings I made in 2017. To implement this design, I used ray-marched metaballs on a bounding sphere to represent the character's hair. The light character has an opaque, luminous material and the shadow character has a dark, translucent material. To simulate light refraction within shadow's body, the environment behind shadow is distorted according to the normal direction of shadow's mesh. I also added post-processing bloom with time-based noise to stylize the look. To let myself control the game's look even more, I also added per-level color correction parameters for the two characters respectively to dim down some levels flooded by volumetric light or give underwater levels a blue tint. In addition to the sound effects, Xiuang Soren He Zi provided background music tracks for the different environment themes and for the two characters respectively. When players advance to a new level or switch character, the background music transitions seamlessly. After nine months of development, the game was published on Steam in February 2021 and supports English and simplified Chinese. As a new university graduate and novice game developer, my experience working on different aspects of this game have been extremely valuable. That includes coming up with the original concept, designing and implementing the game mechanics and using them to create about half of all the levels, implementing the art and rendering pipeline in the game engine, creating all the 2D and 3D art assets, communicating with other developers, and integrating their work into the game. This experience gave me an in-depth look into the game creation process beyond the school curriculum and allowed me to take many of the lessons learned into my post-graduation projects, be them collaboration within a large team or new small games like this, whenever I get the chance and a new spark of thought. Thank you for viewing my capstone project presentation.
Now I'm going to play the trailer for this game before taking any questions anyone might have. Thank, Thank you, Rain. That was great. That's just so gorgeous and so much work that went into that. Um, so in addition to like making a fantastic game, you also got a crash course in project management, which um, I'm really interested to hear, you know, sort of what your experiences even managed, even though this was a small team, but managing that team, what do you think you got from that? Oh, wow. Yeah, this really was a crash course on project management because like it's my first time working on a project this scope. Um, in school, you usually have the projects uh, that run at most a semester, mostly just like two or three weeks. And this is like a way bigger scope than that. Um, for project management, um, I don't know. Well, um, I was pretty much the solo developer for uh, most of the duration of the development process. Uh, most of other developers joined later, like close to the uh, publishing date. Uh, when I was just working by myself, um, I tried to set milestones, but uh, they like uh, end up being ran over again and again. It was supposed to be like finished uh, <laughs> within a summer, but um, apparently I took way longer than a summer to uh, accomplish that. Um, but um, I, I think the lesson learned is that, well, first, um, things are like, like always take longer than expected. And like things can go wrong in like any way you do not expect in the first place. There are like functionalities that um, um, get cut out after I worked on a full, full time for basically two months. There are things that you think you assume will work, but then uh, when, you play test the game, it just doesn't work and you revise it again and again and taking way longer than expected. Um, one thing I think is that to just basically um, accept the unpredictable nature of game creation. Um, but um, also like having the set deadline in the end also pushed myself to, instead of like trying to make everything perfect and fix every single tiny bug that like nobody else will notice, uh, should like prioritize things to get them done and have a final product before like um, trying to make it perfect in every way I can, I guess. Um, yeah, that is, I mean, that's one of those things that you learn by doing. And so I'm really glad that you, that you got to have the experience and you have such a great um, object at the end. Uh, so again, thank you for sharing. And this is on Steam. People can look for it and download it and play it. So, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. I welcome anyone to support me. <laughs> yes. Everybody go download it and from the Steam <laughs> and, then, and then put up reviews so everybody can see them. Okay, cool. Um, we have, oh, look, we're, we've got three minutes before it's 945 and, and we move on to our next uh, presentation. So 
Um, because I know that that some of you have uh, given the link and told people to um, come see you at certain times, um, I will pause us here for the next three minutes. Um, and Jacob, uh, we'll get going at 9.45 with you, okay? Okay, thanks, Rain. Thank you. All right, we've hit the magic number of 9.45. So Jacob, it's all yours. Cool. Wow, we are here. Um, hi, my name is Jacob Paul. I'm a senior in the Bachelors of Humanities and Arts program. I've been studying professional writing and communication design, and I'm finishing up a minor in photography. So today I'm gonna to be presenting my capstone project, which I'm calling, We Can't Hide the Way It Makes Us Glow. Here's a little poster I made. Um, I've been working to develop a sense of belonging that's deeply rooted in Pittsburgh and goes beyond the now. And I've done this by making photos and doing some writing. So the project starts, where is it? Um, well, I'm missing a photo. The project starts here in my apartment. Um, I spent a lot of time alone in the past year. I'm sure that everyone can relate, but it was really hard for me. With my anxiety, every day was its own little trial. And I didn't really hang out with anyone from March through June. Stuck inside, I managed to learn to develop film in my kitchen, but I wasn't making any photos that felt right. I was eager to be out in the world among people and community. When I started to bike around Pittsburgh in June, the world outside was different. Maybe it was the abrupt break, the isolation or the helicopter chops um, from cable news and, and the police trailing the protests, but I found myself on guard. And um, my fearfulness showed up in the photos that I made. The sidewalks, the skies and the shadows became suffused with a sense of tension. And um, the city wasn't really, didn't really feel like a friendly place. Um, I got more comfortable outside and eventually st uh, started going to uh, Flagstaff Hill in Shenley Park. And when it was nice out during the summer, the hill would just be covered in or filled up by people, you know, on blankets, reading, sunbathing, relaxing with their friends in, in their own little worlds, trying to belong. And 
I found such a sense of ease among them. Um, it, even though I was, you know, I didn't know who they were. And one day I saw these two guys playing Frisbee um, with such a ridiculous intensity. It was like, it was like they were in the Super Bowl. They were shouting and laying out and they were like dripping with sweat. And I went up and asked to make some photos of them. And uh, this photo came about. I was just so excited to see people engaging so vividly <laughs> um, with anything. And um, I, I uh, yeah, this photo has come to be one of my favorite from this project. Um, the past year continued to be confusing and difficult, but Shenley became a refuge, kind of became the only place to go. So I kept going there and a lot of my, my best photographs are in Shenley. Um, initially, I wanted to make a comprehensive project about Pittsburgh, but as I learned more and more about photography, I got more interested in subjectivity. Instead of making something sweeping and authoritative, I've tried to embrace my perspective and explore the way that I see the world. And so these photos aren't really literal documents. They're more, I don't know, they're just pictures. And it's about kind of the experience of looking at the picture and uh, that can mean a lot of things to different people. Um, I'm affected by the world as much as anyone or anything that I photograph. Sometimes it shatters me and sometimes it fills me with joy. We can't hide the way it makes us glow. That bring, it brings me to my title, which I grabbed from a line in a Beach House song called Take Care. Um, to me, it speaks to that idea of subjectivity. I'm gonna show a slideshow that I, of some photos that I made in the past year, and I'm gonna play that take song while we take a look at it. Stephanie, how much time do I have left? You have eight minutes remaining. 
Oh, fantastic. Um, so I don't want to tell anybody how to interpret my photos or what to think of them, but there are a few more themes and ideas that I want to emphasize. Um, so though I've, I've looked for moments that feel special and sometimes even sublime, I've kind of worked to place these photos in the world and I haven't really wanted to deny the regularness of these scenes. I think them being kind of in this city um, and clearly in, a, in, in the city is what makes them feel special. I've also been exploring masculinity throughout this project. I've been curious of how masculinity is at play in the portraits that I make and in the city at large with all these war monuments and sports teams and this industrial identity. I love this photo of these uh, three skaters. I met them in Oakland. And um, I think men my age typically move around with like a performative nonchalance. And, and these guys didn't really have any of that. When I asked to take a picture of them, they squeezed together tightly and all smiled. And I could tell that they really adored one another and really weren't afraid to treasure their friendship. I found that, I found that really refreshing to see. Some of the photos that I showed today were made on my iPhone. Others were on 35 millimeter film, some on medium format and some on digital cameras. In all, I've shot with nine different cameras during this project. There's a convention that photo projects should all be made on the same type of camera, but I've decided, at least for this project, that the tools aren't that important. They're all pictures. I'm nearly done shooting photos for this project, and I'm now playing around with how to incorporate writing. I'm trying to, I'm working to compile these photos into a zine or a booklet, and I'd like to print 15 copies of the first edition by the end of June. I think that physicality is really important when it comes to looking at photographs. When you print a photo, even just at Walgreens, it becomes an object that exists beyond you and also beyond the now. The digital, you know, it kind of slips away quickly. Recently, I've come across, uh, recently I've come across a trove of old photos at a junk shop in Bloomfield. And I've been totally caught off guard by how much these little musty prints have resonated with me. Um, here's one of my favorites. So this guy, he's at an Air Force base and he's holding up um, on a little hanger. There's a bunch of gross looking socks and he's just bursting in laughter. <laughs> um, it's, it's, this one's dated 1943. Um, here's another one. It's tiny, but you see this little person in the scene. And um, on the back, it's written Lake Biwa region, which I, I looked that up and that's somewhere in Japan. And um, I don't know that much about the US's colonial history and after the war, but I find it fascinating that somebody who was kind of stationed there was also trying to connect to the world by taking pictures of it. So I hope that my photos, well, I, if I, I'll just show a few more. This is actually in New York State, seems to be some construction, 1942. I hope that my photos um, have so much, have just as much depth as these. And I hope that 80 years from now, somebody comes across a print of one of my photographs and is able to experience something that's just as profound as, um, as I've had with, with these little things. Uh, that's my project. Thanks for taking a look. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was great. Um, you have uh, quite a, uh, group of fans on uh, the YouTube live stream. Um, many of your, your faculty mentors are very much appreciating um, the work that you've put in here. Um, these really are beautiful, beautiful pieces and images. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, in just a 
the couple minutes we have before we turn over to our next presentation, I did want to point out, and I know you talked a little bit about this and we've talked about this, but the presence of infrastructure in your images um, is such an interesting way of establishing place and really, like you said, accepting it as it is um, and making that everydayness really a crucial part of enjoying and appreciating the place where you are. Um, we do have a question um, from Nisia um, that asks, uh, I see here your eye for visual storytelling. Is there a core lens you take with both forms? Which is really a great question. Like how do you, how do you focus your perspective as a writer and as a visual artist? That's a great question, and I'll I'll just say I'm figuring it out. <laughs> okay. I think it's yeah. um, it's complicated in both forms, but it's it's complicated and nuanced in different ways. Yeah, I can see. I yeah, that's a complicated question for appearing so simple. So maybe that's something to take forward as you think about how to bring the writing into this project. Is is thinking about your lens um, on both of them. Um, Jane McCafferty has asked if you could make a permanent slideshow of these things that you could share, and I think that would be a fantastic um, portfolio piece to have. Um, especially with the music, because it really did, you know, like you said, you were, you were inspired by that line. Um, and I think it adds a lot um, to what's already a really powerful set of set of visuals. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you, everybody else for joining us. Um, we will move along to our next presenter. Hi, Aaron. Hello. <laughs> uh, I have a recording for you, correct? That's correct. Let me, I keep closing it. When I stop the recording, I keep closing. So hold on, let me bring it back up. Um, would you like to introduce yourself or will the video do that for us? Um, the, the video does it for us, but I can always do that if you want me to. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and tell us, tell us who you are. Sure. My name is Erin Lim. I'm in BHA for Global Systems and Management and Music Performance. Um, and today I'll be presenting my capstone called Through My Eyes podcast. Um, and yeah, the introduction in the video will explain it more. All right, let's play. Hello, my name is Erin Lim. I'm in BHA for Music Performance and Global Systems and Management, and uh, today I will be presenting my BXA Senior Capstone project called Through My Eyes podcast, uh, and my project advisor was Professor Yasuhara. So a brief introduction to my topic. So this project is centered around Japanese and Japanese American students living cross-culturally in, in uh, Japan and the States. And the purpose is to understand more about Japanese culture and how these students I've interviewed formulated their cultural uh, identities in both of these countries, as well as the benefits and the struggles of having um, these cross-cultural lifestyles. And my project is a collection of interviews, podcast style, um, uploaded to Spotify. And I did it this way because I really wanted to have very casual conversations and discussions with the Japanese community um, and to provide an opportunity for these uh, Japanese students to have a platform and to not only talk about their personal stories, but also to shed a light onto the Japanese community, which is a pretty small minority of the, of the Asian community in Pittsburgh and the US. And so now I want to go into why I think this topic is important to address. So I personally struggle with this self-conflict of cultural identity and place in society um, as a Korean American living and growing up my whole life in the U.S. I would consider myself not completely Korean as I feel that I am not fully accepted from the motherland, but I'm also um, still very much Korean in the States and I can't really, I'm not really fluent in the language and such. So um, I definitely share this self-conflict. And the second reason is that this whole podcast gives opportunities uh, for the interviewees to shed light onto their community, which is, as I mentioned before, uh, fairly a minority in Pittsburgh and the US as compared to other Asian communities. 
Um, and this podcast also helps to explain how they um, came to define their cultural self-identities and their personal journeys to come to that revolution. And the last reason I find this important is that I personally want to learn more about Japanese culture um, and hear the stories and hear what Japan is all about from my own peers at CMU. So here is the process of how I went about this project. I first interviews with the Japanese and Japanese American students. And then I also took a Japanese culture course this semester at CMU to learn more about the facts and the history of the culture. And then lastly, I did additional academic research to support my findings. So here's a cute snapshot of all the people that I interviewed. Uh, we can also look at the business practices in Japan where there's a lot of cultural influences actually on such practices. So um, education and occupation are highly indicators and factors to your status. Um, and because of this cultural influence, uh, there's their Junkin system where there's emphasis on producing a loyal, disciplined workforce. And the characteristics that come out of these business practices are companies are now seen as families. This is pretty much of a traditional conception of companies coming out of the postmodern era, uh, or the, po I'm sorry, the post-war era of Japan, where um, Japan was trying to get through this economic boom um, after the wars. Now all of these companies, they stressed being seen as familial in order to um, produce the long-term longevity of employment and loyalty and commitment from um, its employees. So part of Japanese culture is the sense of belong belongingness through the group. And um, it's very much pivotal to find a place um, with this group mentality, whether that's at your company or uh, in your friend group. And this is a very traditional, um, a traditional fact in how many Japanese people behave socially. Uh, jibun is also, it also means self as a fraction. So you see yourself as a fraction of this greater group um, in Japan. And ien or en are, it means ties used to create groups or places to belong or um, which all contribute to one's identity. And some of these assumptions are that um, every individual is insignificant when you're alone. So individual, individuality is not as important as um, collective, collectivism and being part of, group, of, of a group. It's like you're a cog in the machine. You know, you're part of this greater being in Japan where you're working hard and you're contributing. And that's, that's what makes your identity and your, and your status. Another uh, part of this analysis is looking at the social mob mobility in Japan. So, um, there, it takes a long range of effort to raise your status um, traditionally and still uh, through education and your occupation um, involving these two characteristics, doryoku, which means effort, and kuru, or suffering. And some of the assumptions that arise, um, this collective strive for role perfection in, in Japanese society, as well as this reinforced idea of belongingness when uh, everyone's goals are to elevate the whole group status. Now moving on to the following two clips, I will be showing recordings of a Japanese and a Japanese American who describes the difference of being in Japan and the US. In the first clip, Anju, who is full Japanese, describes the gap she feels from the locals in Japan because she has different values and behaviors. I know I'm really fluent and everything because, you know, my parents put me through all the schooling and yeah. things like that. And I sound very much native. I look very mm -hmm. much native, but like mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of my values and the way I behave is definitely mm -hmm. like very different from regular Japanese people. And mm -hmm. when I, the times that I've been to Japan, um, people assume that I'm like just a normal Japanese person because of mm -hmm. the way I look and the way I sound. Mm -hmm. But apparently, like the way I behave kind of like feels off for them in a sense after uh -huh. interact with me. So 
part of me is kind of like ashamed when I go there and like they assume I'm a regular Japanese pe- person but like truly I'm not at all and I don't understand mm. how they think or how they behave in a sense mm. so I feel like I feel like I put up a front or like I look on the outside very much assimilated but I'm actually mm. not and I feel like that kind of gap really wears down on me and then or maybe mm. like it looks different I know it's hard to like be different in like you know in eastern asian kind of community mm-hmm. so like i really don't feel comfortable living there for a long mm-hmm. period ha- of time so especially since i've grown up in the us for such a long time i just feel like it's more of where i belong right and here in the second clip maya who is half japanese describes the issue of foreigners and hafu's representation in japan and the us more foreign people are coming in. I would really like to see more representation. There are a lot more Asian people on TV right now, which is kind of nice to see, Um, but it's still at the stage where they're treated as kind of like the token Asian, the token um, (laughs) foreigner on a TV show. Right. So I don't know if I'll be able to see that big Mm -hmm. of a progress in my lifetime, to be honest. Wow, that's very interesting. It's kind of like, you're like you're like in the middle. You wish that there was more like Asian or like diversity representation in Japan, but also like your time in the U.S. Um, like I bet there's a part of you who like wishes there's more of like a Japanese presence in the U.S. So it's like that's like a huge crossroad. Like, I know. <laughs> I'm, uh, not like oh a college crisis right now. Where I'm like, where am I going to work? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So to wrap things up, my goal for this project was to analyze the factors that affect the social behavior and the values in Japan so that I may be able to draw connections from my interviewees insights about their pros and their struggles living cross-culturally between uh, Japan and the U.S. And from here on, I hope to continue this podcast and potentially expand it to other Asian communities beyond the Japanese community in order to gain a broader perspective on the cross-cultural experiences um, other Asian communities go through. And I can foresee how this podcast may help me potentially gain a stronger bond to the Asian community, as well as draw me closer to my own culture. So that concludes my presentation and thank you so much for watching. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. That was really interesting. Um, and so we, that podcast is available on Spotify. If anybody wants to go look for it, can you tell us the name again so people can find it? Yeah, it's called Through My Eyes on okay. Spotify. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I think like it's such a generic name, so it's gonna be kind of difficult to find it on Spotify. But... That's all right. And you've got beautiful <laughs> cover art, so you can always just look for that. Um, yeah, so we have a couple of minutes and I have um, a question or two. One is, um, I know, I know that this was a, this was a shift from what you, int- what you initially started your project to be. And I'm wondering what prompted that move and, um, and do you feel like you, you got what you needed out of, out of making that shift? For sure. So yes, I definitely made this shift pretty late in the semester. But the thing is, is that my initial topic, it was like centered around social media and like how to grow a business and such, but it lacked the, the meaning and the connection I had to it as compared to this topic where um, this topic allowed me to connect with people um, online. Um, I think it's like kind of similar to, you know, Jacob's presentation where it's like throughout COVID, like it's just so hard to connect with others in public, um, especially with, you know, my peers at CMU, you know, I'm graduating this semester and I would love to connect with more CMU students at this time. And what, what better way to do it than for my capstone where I can learn more about these students you know backgrounds and their international experience you know and I also was taking this Japanese culture course this semester and it just got me really interested in Japanese culture and that's why I was like you know there's JSA at CMU I should hit them up and that's exactly what I did. Awesome um I'm I'm so glad that it worked out for you and you got so many so many interviews um did you find I, I think it's interesting um 
you know, you, you, I know we talked a little bit um, previously about um, whether to expand this beyond college students to talk to other people in the community. Um, do you feel like, do you, as a hypothesis, would you think that you would get um, different or similar kinds of responses from people outside sort of the, the little world of CMU? Absolutely. I mean, every culture, there's like different perspectives on being international, in the, especially in the States. Um, but I think there definitely will be um, a broader like connection and similarities in each different communities. Like, um, like what it is to be like an immigrant in the States or what it's like to be like Korean American and then going back to your motherland, like you you still don't feel completely accepted by the locals. Like I think like there would be definitely shared commonalities. Um, but yeah, like I definitely want to continue with this podcast, expand it to other communities and hear their stories. I know that there's just so much more to explore with this podcast. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad that you were able to start down this path, and I'm, I'm excited to see where you take it. Um, anything else you want to leave us with? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, I guess, I guess, like for the sake of time, like for this presentation, I had to cut, cut a lot of information. Um, but I also just want to emphasize that these are personal stories uh, from these CMU students, so they don't necessarily represent like the broader like Japanese community at all. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to share their um, stories on this platform. Thanks, yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good way of contextualizing it um, because that that lived experience, um, you know, like you said, may differ between people, but being able to, you know, find the points of commonality um, and be able to, you know, build a community around that, I think is really important. And I'm glad you were able to do that. All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, and we will sh shift over now to Kathy. Hi. Can you share my screen real quick? Yeah, you should be able to. Cool. Um, so hi, my name is Kathy Zhang and I'm a BHA student studying art and environmental and sustainability studies. Today I'll be talking about my BXA Senior Capstone, which is a website I made called Entropy Catalog. Um, and before I get started, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Abigail Owen, for supporting me through this project and um, for being such an amazing mentor throughout my undergraduate career at CMU. Um, and this project was, was also supported in part by funding from the Carnegie Mellon University Frank uh, Ratchie Fund for Art at the Frontier. Um, so my capstone project documents the type of products offered to students in Carnegie Mellon's on-campus convenience store, Entropy. Um, but it's ultimately a call to action for Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and I'll be going over what that letter entails for this presentation. Um, yeah, so sustainability and waste management are often approached within a framework of individualized responsibility uh, where more passive actions like recycling are emphasized instead of addressing the root issue of waste production. Um, and over the summer of, uh, yeah, summer of fall of 2020, I researched this issue and asked how did we get to this point of maximum trash and what could be done to improve the cultural relationship um, between the producer consumer and the endless stream of trash in my research paper, which is called Convenience and Waste, a critical study of sustainability of opportunities for a senior's campus. Um, and through this research, I found that in order to establish a more sustainable waste management system, producers must recognize and act upon their responsibility in minimizing the amount of waste their products create rather than promoting the individualization of responsibility. Um, and I studied the social, cultural, and political systems surrounding waste management because I wanted to identify how waste management practices at CMU could be improved um, to maximize sustainability. And I concluded that CMU plays into this individualization of responsibility by fostering a campus, which makes it difficult for students to live sustainably while also pushing initiatives that depend on student choices. Um, and I argue in my paper that one fundamental fundamental way the university could live up to their commitment to sustainability is through the creation of an office of sustainability. 
Um, and this semester I applied my research to entropy and combined my findings uh, with my experience within sustainability at CMU as the housing sustainability lead and advocacy chair for sustainable earth um, to write this letter to CMU. And I chose to focus on entropy because of its convenience for students. It offers a variety of necessary items and is easily accessible being located right in the middle of campus. Um, so this website features a general layout of the convenience store. And as the viewer stays on the home page, products in the store um, or products of the store sells begins to crowd the screen and transform into trash. Um, and there's an overwhelming amount of plastic packaging on the products offered to students by the store. I noticed that the only products which didn't contain any packaging um, were some selections of pretty expensive fruit. Um, and the companies which supply entropy are also mostly large corporations, which are largely to blame for the amount of waste produced today. Um, and this can be found in the catalog section, which is literally, it's just a list of the products that the store sells. Um, it's a pretty long list, but yeah, but I think the most important aspect of this website is my letter to CMU. Um, like most universities, CMU often touts its um, commitment to sustainability and paints itself as a leader in the field. But as a student who has been active in my efforts to make the campus a more sustainable place, I've had a drastically different experience than the one CMU advertises. Responsibility for waste um, for sustainability is often pushed onto the shoulders of students, um, the same students who don't have the time or resources to make substantial systemic change at the university. And this is something I've seen happen again and again within the university's primary um, environmental sustain sustainability called Sustainable Earth. Being the only campus organization focused on environmental sustainability, the club covers a wide range of topics and projects. And while the club has many dedicated members, it's stretched pretty thin. And because of the lack of university resources, the club often becomes um, a sustainability hub people go to in search of those resources. So for example, students from the club have stood by trash cans in CMU's University Center to direct others on how to sort their trash um, as requested by the university. And while Sustainable Earth enjoys helping out fellow students and providing information, when the university begins coming to the club in search of volunteers to do work that should be paid for, the, um, that clear lack of commitment for sustainability from CMU um, is emphasized. And my membership in the club also led me to find my housing sustainability position, um, which was mostly centered around improving waste management practices across the university's residential facilities. While working in the position, I felt extremely passionate about the projects we pursued. Um, and I worked closely with three other student staff members and created educational posters and presentations for the students. We also tabled in dorms and even dug through trash by hand for trash audits. Um, most initiatives were education-based, so like teaching other students how to recycle and live sustainably while living on campus. Um, and looking back and reflecting on our initiatives, what the housing sustainability assistance could work on was very superficial. Even when I became more involved at a higher level after being promoted to the housing sustainability lead, it was difficult to make more systemic changes within waste management. And the projects my team could work on really only address symptoms of a bad waste management system rather than tackling the problem of waste management or waste production itself. We didn't have the authority or funding to fundamentally change how CMU approached sustainability. And I feel like I spent a lot of time and effort which ultimately led to unremarkable changes. Um, the sustainability initiatives CMU does work on are very similar to what I also worked on within housing. Uh, in that they focus on fixing the symptoms of a bad waste management system rather than the problem itself. The language CMU uses online and on posters suggests that waste creation and disposal are, disposal are still responsibilities of the individual because of their emphasis on recycling. Um, CMU's recyc recycling and waste management website page shows how to dispose of waste at the university with one section even dedicated to a list of vague reasons why recycling is important. Um, which includes to reduce global warming, to prevent air pollution, to solve the problem of scarcity of landfills, um, et cetera. And this language emphasizes that the university's waste management system continues to work off the framework that the uh, individual is responsible for consuming and therefore discarding trash. And this 
strategy fails to criticize the larger issue of production within waste management systems. If anything, I feel like the opposite has been stressed to students as the university's priority. Um, for example, during Sustainable Earth's monthly meetings with CMU's Sustainability Initiative Steering Committee, a member of the committee said that he would like to focus on uh, not what the university should be doing, but what students individually should be doing. This fixation on recycling and individual responsibility draws attention to either a lack of understanding about sustainability or a lack of commitment towards sustainability, which could both be addressed through a group of passionate, knowledgeable people in the form of an office of sustainability. Um, and I believe the office has failed to live up to its commitment to lead by example and preserving and protecting our natural resources through its refusal to create this office. I've met with the steering committee I mentioned, um, which was created by Provost Jim Garrett in response to demands to create an office. Um, and I've met with them to talk about, to further talk about creating an office. Um, and each time I've come away disappointed and frustrated over the past few years, uh, CMU's president and provost have received an onslaught of recommendations to create this office. These requests have come from a group of students who've res who researched creating an office, the graduate student assembly, the undergraduate student senate, the faculty senate ad hoc committee on sustainability at CMU, um, which also wrote a 15 page report supporting such an office. More than 300 students and alumni who signed a petition and sustainable earth through our meetings and also a letter that we wrote. Rather than creating this office, the university instead adopted a sustainability initiative, which focuses on the uh, United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, um, and the initiative holds very little in concrete action. With the exception of one person, leadership within the initiative are not individuals solely focused on, um, in the, focused on sustainability at the university, but rather include faculty and staff already involved um, at the sustainability and other manners. Entropy is a significant part of most students' lives at CMU. It's in, um, it is important that it, that it reflects the university's claims of sustainability in the products they offer, how they treat their staff, and in pricing. Ultimately, the issues at Entropy are only one aspect of CMU's broken approach on sustainability. These issues affect the university everywhere and at every level. And instead of all of these student-led efforts, there is a serious need for coordinated and targeted work with the full attention of the university brought to these issues. Based on sustainability being listed as one of CMU's eight core university values, the university clearly recognizes the importance of sustainability, yet it refuses to even create an office for it. CMU must start living up to its own promises and create a centralized office for sustainability with full-time staff, administration, and a budget. Um, and I hope this website and small animation of sorts highlights the lack of an office as a major issue within the university and entropy as a symptom of that and helps redirect university administration toward better decisions and a more sustainable and just campus in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. That was fantastic. Um, uh, a little disheartening, not because of you, but because, um, you know, hearing uh, what your path has been in pursuing this and really being dedicated to um, making change that does something, right? Um, I'm really, I'm really struck by how carefully you attended to the rhetoric of sustainability that, that the university puts out and that, and that other you know, institutions put out around this um, and how much that focus on the individual does, does hide a whole lot of other possibilities um, and necessary changes that have to happen there. So I think your reading of that is um, really important and really needs to continue to be highlighted, right? That when you see that kind of language to think about what's hiding behind that language, um, what's not being done um, and instead, what's being what's being proposed as um, not systemic change, but individual change. Um, and I think you're you're also really, really have hit on an important reason why universities need to lead this, right? Because this is something that um, by establishing these norms around sustainability, not only you know, are universities big places that make a lot of trash, 
um, and use a lot of resources, but those the people who are attending that will carry those values and beliefs and um, possibilities into the future. Um, yeah, really interesting. Um, yeah, I, and to have a charge, a call to action at the end of a presentation, the capstone is always great. So um, let's all continue leaning on the university to make this happen. Thanks, Kathy. Um, anything that you want to leave us with? Um, oh, the sustainability initiative actually has a form you can fill out on its website and I think it'd be cool if everyone like filled it out asking for an office. Yes. Could you, um, send that to me and I will <laughs> find yeah. a place to put it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, and we are on to, as I switch between all of my different screens, um, Ian Moore is going to present for us. Um, Ian, would you like to introduce uh, your video or should we just dive in? Uh, I think it just introduces itself, so might as well just dive in. It's, oh, okay. yeah. Oh, sorry, I have to find where I put it. I put it someplace else, here it is. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah. I have it, I have it. Cool. <laughs> um, I just have to put it in the right place. Hold on, bear with me. <laughs> if you want me to, I can just do it live if you need me to, it's, it's nope. just a, okay. I got it, I just gotta get to, <laughs> again, way too many tabs and screens and there Fair we go. Enough. All right, here you are. My name is Ian Moore, and I am BSA major with concentrations in mathematics and art. For my capstone project, I've made the Morse Sphinx project, which is an art role-playing game, or ARPG for short. Now to explain what that means and why I decided to make one, I'm going to take a step back to when I was 13 and first diving into the depths of DeviantArt.com. I discovered a wonderful place named, aptly, Horse Art RPG, which was essentially a game where you and a bunch of strangers on the internet drew horses points for it. And I, freshly equipped with a brand new Wacom tablet I could barely use, and a strong desire to draw lots of horses, could not have been more pleased. It's been nine years, and I am still playing. Not just the one, there's actually lots of these kinds of games. Horse Art RPG defined an archetype and seeded the ground for a lively community of these games, the ARPGs. Seriously, what are you into? We've got birds, we've got dogs, we've got dragons, we've got bird dog dragons, there's one about spiders, and so, so, so many horses. Personally speaking, after horses, I got very into big cats that could eat me. So, what is it that's appealing about these games? They're not just drawing about drawing animals, although they definitely are that. They're also about storytelling and personal artistic growth. They encourage you to create within a community through a game-like structure. It's joyous, it's compelling, and it takes both burgeoning artists like myself and people who might not otherwise consider themselves creators and gives us a drive to make things, a platform to share them with, and a community to support us in our endeavors. And yes, while it did initially focus on visual artists, it has been steadily expanding to include writers, sculptors, photographers, and many other types of media. And that's what's so fascinating to me. It's a style of gaming I've never seen anywhere else, something that's so purely creative driven. I think the closest mainstream analogy I can come up with is a tabletop game like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, which are similarly designed to foster creative agency and the ability to tell your own story. But those games are really just designed to support storytelling around the width of a table, whereas ARPGs have hundreds and occasionally thousands of players, each with their own narratives and goals, and ARPGs still manage to support them all at once. But these games were born on DeviantArt, and they haven't really left it. Which is a shame, because I would love to see what this approach to gaming could look like on a much bigger and broader scale. What kinds of stories could be told? How many people might find their own creative voices through it? 
And also, I find that it's just brought a lot of joy in my life, and I would love to share that with others. But of course, there's a lot of work to do before we could talk about it going above and beyond. That is why I started this project, but if I want any of that to happen, I have to make the thing first. So this is where I'm at, the Morse Sphinx project. It is set in a nearish fut alternate future where we've started using genetic engineering to bring mythological creatures into reality. It centers particularly around the titular Morse Sphinx. Why? Big cat that could eat me. <laughs> That's why. In particular, I'm interested in themes of the extinction, post-naturalism, and what happens when we as a culture really start to mess around with genetic engineering through a fantastical lens. Now, it is COVID times, and this is a big project. I did not set out to make a fully functioning game ready to launch by the end of this semester. What I've got instead is I've written a proof of concept, the structure of the game, its lore, and its mechanics. ARPGs usually run on volunteer manpower and random number generators, and technically speaking, with some volunteers to serve as admins, it is playable. But I will be the first to admit that it needs a lot of fine-tuning still. I've started this process by reaching out to some members of the ARPG community and asking for their feedback, experiences, and advice as I work. The details, the numbers of it are still rough, but I'm confident that the overshape and mechanics are what I want them to be. Essentially how the game works is the game hands the player a prompt and the player runs off and tells the story they want to tell with that prompt. When they're done, they come back and the game says, good job, tell me more. And you can imagine the kind of power that has when you start seeding it with complex and interesting topics that have relevance to the real world. So I pick topics I find interesting and want to explore with other people. This is all done through a few different ways. First and foremost is the setting and the Morse Sphinx itself. This is, in a sense, the main prompt. The Morse Sphinx is a genetically engineered chimera, my slightly fantastical look at what might happen if you tried to create the mythological Sphinx by mixing together real-world species both living and extinct. I've designed the Sphinx's history of development its anatomy and its general behavior, including a semi-realistic genetic system because that's the kind of thing I find fun. I've populated the world with important characters that players can interact with and places they can use as settings and other species that are in line with the game's theme. And these are just prompts. The players can choose how much they want to interact with them. They can choose to ignore basically all of it if they want. Obviously, I hope they wouldn't, and that some aspect of the course setting is appealing to them and the stories they want to tell, but they are welcome to take their futuristic cat and put it on pirate ships, and that's perfectly within the bounds of the game. In fact, I think it's one of the strengths of the game of the ARPG genre is that it's so flexible, because ultimately the goal is to get players to create within the community, and if pirate ships are where their hearts are at, who am I to stop them? The next is a set of rubrics by which the material players create is awarded points. This is mainly for measuring players' advancement through the game and offering rewards for the efforts they've put in. I've done my best to keep this as open-ended and flexible as possible to allow for, you know, pirate ships or whatever, while awarding the drives I want to curate, namely storytelling, community engagement, and personal artistic growth. And lastly, are the more traditional game-like mechanics. Things like events and activities, prompts and crafting, and the delicious in-game rewards you get for participating in and completing them. This drives the community together and keeps the players invested in the game. Resource management is a big theme throughout the whole thing. Every item is expendable, but you can earn it again and again through participation. This is both because I think it pairs well with the overall theme of big creature and urban setting, and also because it addresses some of the gameplay issues community members express of other REOPGs. What remains now is essentially <clears throat> rigorous playtesting. I need to test numbers and make sure that everything is balanced the way I want. And you know how I mentioned ARPGs are powered by volunteer admins? It's a large part of what makes them so uniquely personal, because you're talking to a person, not a machine, when you turn stuff in and interact with the mechanics of the game but it also means I need to test how much manpower is needed and I need to experiment with the best ways of streamlining it. And before I can do all of that, I need to build technical support. If the ARPG as a genre is going to survive, 
it will not be able to stay on DeviantArt forever. DeviantArt is a functional but not ideal platform for hosting these games, and it has already shown that it has no interest in catering to their community. So ARPGs are going to have to branch out in some way. Similarly, if I want my game to eventually bridge outside of the community, I have to build it with an eye towards expansion. So I decided it would be in my best interest to create an independent website for it, both so I'm not reliant on a platform that doesn't care about my game, and also so I can automate as much of it as possible, so that admin manpower goes to where it's needed to keep the game personable and not something arbitrary like rolling random numbers. So I use Lorekeeper, an open sourced framework created by the community specifically for hosting ARPGs and similar structures as a base, and I've been working to customize it to my needs. It's built in Laravel, which I have been in the process of learning. So this is where I'm at. I have my proof of concept text, and I have a work in progress website. There is still a good deal of work in the future, but I'm optimistic and I have contacts in the community that are supporting me as development and playtesting continues. And yeah, if any of this sounds interesting to you, by all means, feel free to reach out. Come play with me. I think it's a lot of fun. And who knows, maybe if I get enough people playing with me, we can finally answer the eternal question. Why do I obsess over things with big teeth that could eat me? Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> that is, um, yeah, we've been, you've been talking with me about this project for a long time. So hearing it, you know, sort of all in one place um, was really, really interesting. Um, but especially in terms of how big your goal is for this, right? Like this is not <laughs> just, you know, building, um, uh, like you said, a tabletop game, right? Where it's contained, even though the world itself is large. Um, but this, you know, if I'm understanding it right, that this is you setting up the ground, like the ground rules, the foundation, um, and then letting, and then handing over control, right? To, to your players. Essentially, yeah. Um, did, it's kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's, it's kind of twofold because you both have, um, the players are the ones telling the story, but you also have the game itself holding the reins. So it's a constant balance between the two where even as like the game owner and creator, as I run it, I never really let go of control, but I still like, I still have to give room for the players to do whatever they want. Yeah, that sounds like a, like really a challenge in, um, you know, sort of giving that freedom, but then also anticipating all of the, all of the things that you have to respond to there. Um, and you said that you, so you've been working on Lorekeeper as a, a platform for it. Is that what has been useful there and what has been challenging there? So for Lorekeeper, it is, it is, it's essentially, it's, it's a framework website. So it's just like a, a kind of um, template that you can put information into. And it isn't like really customized to what I needed. It's actually, so there's a few like similar but not quite the same games that are on DeviantArt and in the same kind of sphere. And it's set up for one of those. So a lot of it has been me digging into the back end and like figuring out how to restructure things exactly how I need it. Um, I chose to use it because it has a lot of like automation already built in, so I don't have to sit through it and like figure out how to do all that myself. Um, but a lot of the like the way the information is stored and like um, the overall structure of things, I'm just going to have to. I'm I'm working on remodeling so that it'll fit exactly what I need. It's a big project. So are you? <laughs> I assume this is going to be ongoing for you. Yeah, I mean, I never set out uh, to make the whole thing and like have it ready to play for the capstone. The idea was just to like get the groundwork rolling. It's something I kind of wanted to do for a long time. So this is a good excuse to get started. And now I have work done and I can keep going. Cool. Our, so what would you say, like if we sort of streamlined um, all of all of this work, what would you say is like the key skill set that you've that you've 
used and developed um, over the course of this project? I think there's kind of two. One is like game design and actually writing it and trying to balance it and working with members of the community to figure out like what appeals to them most in a game. And the second part is Laravel and coding the website. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot, a lot that you got done. All right. Um, thank you very much, Ian, for that presentation. Um, and we will, we've got another sort of three minute, let's all take a breath. If you have, if you've been here with us um, and you need to get yourself a drink of water, get yourself a drink of water. I have water right here. Everybody should have some water and stretch. Uh, all right, because next up we have Rebecca. Um, so let's give it two minutes. So we're back on, um, back on track for 1045 and then we'll then we'll talk to Rebecca. All right, now it is 1045, Rebecca. Uh, are we ready to show your recording? Do you wanna introduce it? Um, yes, so it's a uh, slideshow, basically all the work, there's a lot more to it, um, but I narrowed it down to the main three challenges and I speak extensively on all of them. And it's basically just about what is the post VFA climb and what are the challenges that undergraduates are they feel are most daunting, especially when they can't prepare for it academically. So all right. Thanks. I will start it up. For my capstone presentation, my project is called the post BFA climb. It examines the early struggles of BFA students as they navigate the fine arts world after graduation. Before I jump in, I want to preface this presentation with a little about myself. I'm not only a BXA student, but I've also had three years of experience learning about arts management through working at local museums and artist foundations, as well as galleries and auction houses in New York. It was only recently that I had the realization that I've actually been able to work with pieces and artists throughout the entire duration of an artist's career. What I mean by this is I've been able to see the beginnings of their art at a university level, I've worked with artists as they show for the first time at the gallery I currently work at. I've collaborated with early to mid-career artists for museums and more established galleries. And I currently work at a foundation that furthers the legacy of an artist who has since passed. 
While my career path has led me away from being a practicing artist, I became more fascinated in the trajectory of an artist's career and how working artists maintain sustainable careers. At the same time, I am attending classes with my peers who don't know what the next step is once they leave uh, their undergraduate program. There's a huge gap between graduating and living off of their art, and it often feels too big to jump. Many are often unaware of the system they are entering should they want to pursue fine art, as well as the stamina and discipline expected of working artists and the struggle that established artists still grapple with. Now, through my presentation in Capstone, I will be talking about the three main challenges that BFA students struggle with once they graduate, networking, business development, and artistic development. A quick disclaimer that I wanna make is these are challenges that are never fully overcome as they are skills that will develop throughout their entire arts career. They are challenges that are mastered through experience rather than academics. And depending on students' background, some face more disadvantages from the start if we consider who has family connections, financial stability, race, class, and gender. These all can have varying influences over an artist's ability, ability to maintain a practice. However, proficiency in all three is a shared trait by, most, by almost all working artists. For the sake of narrowing my scope, I'll be using CMU's School of Art as a case study to talk about what students struggle with and propose suggestions for solutions that I will address at the end of the presentation. As one of the best schools in STEM, it doesn't surprise anyone that a large portion of students want to enter the arts industry, whether that be UX, UI design, game design, animation, or film. These industries, which have set trajectories and steps to follow are more predictable with a structure in place for artists to climb. For the sake of this presentation, I'll be focusing more on the students who want to pursue a career in traditional fine art, such as 2D and 3D media. The first challenge I'll be discussing is networking. I've included a quote from Hedley Roberts, head of art and design at the University of East London. The quote is, community is the most important and least document documented aspect of any successful artist development. Ultimately, your success will depend entirely on the strength and quality of your network. No artist does it alone. It is a given that networking cannot be taught as it relies on an individual's will to socialize. At the same time, Art is a social community and many opportunities are gained by those that are active members. Some benefits include it can offer opportunities, which is very clear. Directly, opportunities can be offered by a person. Indirectly, however, people are more interested to work with you if other established people can also support and vouch for your practice. It also shows how active you are in the community uh, and your engagement can also increase your visibility. It also can give you insight from professionals. You will continue to grow, but critiques from professionals and peers will help you to grow with more confidence, especially as you leave your BFA program. Longer and more developed benefits include, it can help develop your community so you can grow along with people in the same position as you. Networking can be a struggle for students when they look for opportunities after they graduate because students don't realize the importance of the, the forming their networks while in school. Increasing resources can help, as many different sects of art are not equally assessed and supported, depending on the program. However, the strength of the relationships students form have stronger impacts. According to a study, job seekers with a large social network and with strong ties in their network reported spending more time networking during a job search. Time spent networking was found to relate positively to the number of job offers and explained additional variance over time spent searching through printed advertisement, the internet, and public employment services. Thus, job seekers who spend more time networking receive more job offers, regardless of their use of other job search behaviors. In order to strengthen ties to their community, engagement with these communities as an art student at a university level can lead to higher preparedness of students upon leaving college. As young artists, local art communities and local arts opportunities are the easiest route for students to become more involved uh, as their small scale opportunities act as an easy stepping stone for the inexperienced to become more familiar with existing in ecosystem. Unfortunately, student involvement in the local community outside of their university is severely lacking, especially in the case of CMU School of Art. The school's summer discussion series in 2020 focused on how students do not see themselves as members of the greater community and don't 
have an interest in helping the community grow outside of the university. Outside of local spheres, overall professional development and comfortability reaching out to unfamiliar professionals requires additional research that students may not have the availability to learn or fully understand to conduct on top of being a full-time student. In these cases, the processes of demystifying the networking process as a whole is important in order for students to feel confident in building their community once they have the time, portfolio, and interest to do so. The second challenge is business development, which goes hand in hand with networking. Many opportunities that can be a result of business development can lead to new networking opportunities in the future, such as residencies. The way to reach this point is to understand that making art is half the work. As stated in the book, Navigating the Art World, the two essential elements of an artist's practice could be referred to as the creative side and the business side, and both are as important as each other. When speaking about business, I'm including the necessary non-art skills that working artists have to be familiar with. This includes earning an income that supports the creative side, applying to grants, residencies, opportunities, advocating for yourself as a freelancer, and this includes contracts for work, the commission processes, filing taxes, insurances, etc., having a social media presence, and self-managing yourself as a professional. Unlike other program curriculums that help prepare students for existing positions at established institutions and companies, business is not always seen as a necessary part of an arts curriculum. By learning in an environment that only emphasizes creative experimentation, art students are not always able to gauge the extent of business practices that they should be learning. This inevitably leads to a lot of panic and anxiety when students edge closer to their graduation without a feasible idea of their next step. Simply put, art programs that lack business curriculum put students at a disadvantage. Considering the rising number of art students coming from lower class, less financially stable backgrounds than the historically white elite art students, this also disproportionately affects the futures of disenfranchised students over others. As a second challenge, business is a challenge because it, the extent of it is never fully addressed in academia. It is unglamorous and it requires the same if not more dedication as creating. While each practice varies depending on a person's dedication to their work, I'll be addressing the most important unglamorous parts. Uh, artists are a part of the gig economy and almost all artists have a day job. Artists need to self-manage themselves and their time correctly, no matter if they have a secondary job or not. Ability to perform tasks to complete on time are transferable skills. And side jobs, the ability to complete tasks is required in order to support yourself financially. This rigorous approach to standard jobs is important to also apply to a creative practice so that there's a continuous workflow. Last one is artists need to have a social media presence as a way of easy access for people to view your portfolio. This fits into the community building part as it's the easiest way for like-minded artists to find you. Having regular presence is also important for those interested in exhibiting your work as engagement makes you discoverable and the easiest engagement is through social media. The final challenge is artistic development. A quick disclaimer, artistic development is a lifelong and new grads seldom leave their programs with a concrete idea of the art they're going to make. However, they should be aware that what separates early artistic development from those of established professionals. An arts program's curriculum already addresses artistic development, but the main points I'll be addressing are developing a voice through additional education, technical skills, and critical awareness of the current world. But the challenge posed by having a developed voice or an idea of, an, of a voice that sets artists in a direction that they can follow once they leave. The importance of developing a voice in an undergraduate program is a pressure that can have a reverse effect if overemphasized to students. Students in their BFA should be experimenting with new mediums and concepts. At the same time, leaving a program without a clear idea of what your next step is, is daunting and sometimes more difficult to develop without the structures of an arts curriculum. For those that can afford it, grad school is a decision that shows those in the professional world that as an artist, you are very serious and committed to your practice uh, and developing your technical and conceptual abilities. It gives artists the chance to fully flesh out their voice in pieces that encapsulate their style and subject. Galleries have been known to keep close watch on grad school programs and sign promising artists into their programs before or once they graduate. 
The MFA, however, is expensive that not all students can afford. The lack of a developed voice after BFA can also hinder an artist from entering a competitive MFA program and their interest, uh, and their interest in additional education as a whole. It is worth noting that an MFA for a practicing artist is not always seen as necessary, and many artists have achieved acclaim and success without the degree. However, the MFA is necessary for obtaining a job in teaching art, which has become a widely popular job for practicing artists to supplement their income. Apart from an MFA, technical ability is another piece of artistic development that needs to be addressed because it makes artists attractive outside of their own practice. Currently, many arts programs are focusing on conceptual development over technical ability, which has ushered in a new wave of conceptual art. However, technical skills are still necessary in the art world and sought after by art studios that employ art assistants. They are also transferable as jobs that require digital art familiarity with software can help increase an artist's chance of being hired. Unfortunately, art programs usually expect technical abilities to be developed before a student enters college. Then once in college, exploration of voice takes priority. Because of this, it is important for an artist to keep their skills sharp. Like technical skills in developing a voice, gaining understanding of the current art world is a task that is left up to the artist to decide. It additionally makes networking and business development easier as an artist has a large understanding of which works the audience interacts with the most. Research into galleries, museums, nonprofits, curators, uh, alternative spaces, and other artists uh, has the ability to better shape an art student's practice and understand how they can fit into the art system before they even enter it. And this is my last slide. Thanks, Rebecca. That <laughs> I kind of want to. I I wish I had put you next to Maggie Caballero's uh, presentation on where where jobs in the art in industry are headed. So that um, because I think there's a lot of um, interesting points of contact that you two could talk about. Um, so what what would you say are the next steps then like did this research bring you to a place where i mean you have your proposed suggestions what would your priorities be just based on cmu what would be the 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 top two things that you you would want to see happen the top thing i'd want to see is basically engagement and it's important locally because there are so many that are easy opportunities for students to like be a part of and if you know how to do that you can kind of expand and the other one that is really important is also through social media uh, i actually am curating a show this summer at a gallery and they just asked me to and they basically just recommended go on instagram this is how we find people look who follows who and it's like oh my gosh like this is the process this is what they're all doing and it's like this is how we find you and it's important for us to find you and see you as both an artist and a person and so someone really needs to have that ready to present do you think that um this is probably outside the bounds of of what you research but do you think that having um dedicated workshops or classes on this is it something that you think current BFA students would opt into, or is it something that you think has to be made part of the curriculum in order to um, to make them <laughs> pay attention? I think workshops are fine. It's more along the lines of, we have a professional development class and I wish it was required because it actually gives a huge overlay of everything. But at the same time, the thing that most students struggle with that I've seen is just like the fear of reaching out to a stranger and the fear of like, oh, what do I say? And that is so intimidating to them. And we've had mm -hmm. guest speakers who are amazing and no one interacts with them. And it's a huge question of why, because they're right there and they're very easy. So if anything, it's more demystifying the process that I think that the school should be doing as a whole, which is like, oh yeah, we will have like time actually afterwards. That's not just like Q and A in a huge auditorium, but they sit down with you and they talk to you one-on-one -on -one and being like, what are you interested in? And I feel like if that was there and it's like, oh, this is supportive. This isn't someone like up here, it's someone at my level. Then someone will be more willing to have those questions. Mm -hmm. So more of a mentorship relationship than necessarily yeah. 
guest artist, guest speaker. Interesting. All right. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, and now I am going to shift over to uh, Aaron Kim, who I don't think is um, joining us live, but we've got a recording. Thank you. So, uh, thanks, Rebecca. I've got to find my share screen. There we go. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Kim and I'm a BHA student studying decision science and musicology. Today I will be presenting on my capstone project about wellness at CMU. My project focused on studying the various levels of wellness elements for CMU students. But before I dive into the study itself, I want to talk a bit about the general term called wellness. Around me, I saw that this word was most commonly used for mental wellness. I thought that wellness was all about creating a healthy mindset and doing whatever you could to not fall into a negative mental state. However, I saw the word being used and written on various posters, speeches, advertisements, and in daily conversation. The more I was exposed to the word, the more I got confused about what the word exactly meant. So naturally, I turned to the dictionary. Merriam-Webster's definition of wellness is the quality or state of being in good health, especially as an actively sought goal. This definition might seem like a pretty simple definition to me, and it made me more curious as to whether or not wellness could be measured in smaller elements since the term is used so broadly. As I continued to research the word more in depth, I came across multiple dimensions of wellness. The dimensions split the term wellness into parts that each represent a certain aspect of wellness. The number of dimensions varies from six to even eight or nine, depending on what model is being used. But this model by the National Wellness Institute shows six unique dimensions of wellness. Most of the dimensions are self-explanatory based on their title, but I will describe a little bit about each. The first is occupational, which represents the elements that contribute to one's wellness and career development. This could mean achieving goals and working towards that promotion. The physical is all the aspects that relate to the healthy state of one's body and strength, such as eating right and exercising. The social encourages communication and developing rewarding relationships with people. The intellectual works to engage and stimulate the mind to challenge creative thinking and problem solving. The spiritual revolves around one's beliefs and the balance those values have with our day-to-day -day choices to see how strong one's values remain through the many experiences one may have. And finally, the emotional includes the positive and negative aims, negative and aims to work on coping better with negative emotions and boosting the positive ones. From these six dimensions, I created a personal smaller model with three dimensions that applied better to my everyday life as a college student. These three are environment, people, and mind, body, and spirit. I found that my overall state of wellness was heavily affected by my environments, such as being away from home, the change in weather, and even the personality of the city. Being a part of a new community also influences wellness in that you can meet new friends, teachers, as well as network for career related relationships. And in general, the choices I make for my mind, body and spirit are different in a college setting. There are times where I need to pull on all nighters for schoolwork or decide to eat more snacks. But in general, healthy choices contribute to a healthier wellness state. By applying this model to myself, a college student, I was able to create the research question of, do overall levels of wellness for CMU students change over time? I hypothesized that the levels of various elements do change, such as an increase in schoolwork or social interactions, the levels of wellness would also be influenced and change over time. The format of the study was a two-part study which was launched for credit-seeking students on CVDR SONA. The first phase of the survey was launched at the beginning of March, and the second phase was launched at the beginning of April. 
the same students who participated in the first phase were required to participate in the second phase to compare the results between the same student over time. Each phase of the survey asked questions about the participants month leading up to the day that they took the survey. As for the specific variables, I decided to test four different categories, sleep, stress, happiness, and social activity. The survey questions asked participants to rate how often they felt they had bad sleep quality, how often they felt stressed and not in control, how much they agreed to various statements of happiness or unhappiness, and how often they engaged in various social activities, such as meeting friends and family. Additionally, I implemented a more CMU specific element to the, to the study by advertising the wellness events at CMU. At the end of the phase one survey, I provided links to the event calendars for SLICE, as well as the Student Affairs, Health and Wellbeing Department to provide students an opportunity to engage in any of these events before the phase two survey, where they would later be asked questions about their event participation and experiences. The goal of this element in the study was to see if engagement in CMU wellness events had any effects on the different levels of sleep, stress, and happiness between the two survey times. Overall, 50 students participated in the study. And for these 50 students, the results for CMU wellness event attendance were quite surprising. Only 8% of students attended either a SLICE or health and well-being event, and another eight stated that they wanted to attend but could not find the time. 20% of the students stated that their reason for not attending was because they did not want to attend at all. But the most shocking number was the 63% of students who stated that they did not know the events were happening. It was clear that the advertisement of events in the survey was not made accessible enough for students or there wasn't incentive enough for them to research the more into the types of events that were held. Additionally, students were already participating in personal social events that could already be enough for them to feel that they don't need to participate in extra events or activities. Through this chart, we can see the various elements that were tested in this study compared to one another. All of the ratings that students gave in both surveys were averaged by category to calculate correlations across the variables. In this study, sleep, happiness, and stress were all measured from a negative point of view, meaning that the higher ratings that they gave in the survey meant that they had bad sleep and were more stressed and unhappy. Social activity ratings were measured positively, meaning the higher ratings they gave the more participation they had in various personal social activities. Overall, correlation values between every variable combination between phases one and two are low. So it is difficult to say that the data can be considered significant. Additionally, the test retest reliability value for happiness was much lower compared to the rest of the variables signifying that the responses were more, more random for this category, and it means that the data itself was noisy and unreliable. However, we can still identify some small patterns that arose to at least see the small changes in wellness levels. Higher correlation numbers between sleep, stress, and happiness indicate that as one variable increases, the other increases as well. For example, we see that in phase two, there is a 0.43 correlation between stress and sleep. This meant that, the, that as stress was increasing, the level of bad sleep quality was also increasing, signifying a decrease in overall wellness levels. In terms of social activity, because the variable was measured positively, all of the correlations are negative, meaning that as social activity increases, the level for the rest of the variables decreases. In other words, engaging in more social activities helps with relieving stress, makes students happier, and helps with sleep quality. Overall, the original idea of seeing if CMU wellness event attendance affected levels of sleep, stress, and happiness failed to be measured. However, through the survey data, small patterns could be identified, signaling that with further research, more significant data could be collected to prove that levels of wellness can change over time, depending on the level, level of event and social activity engagement. 
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to Aaron for that really interesting presentation. I'm, I'm being, I'm struck by how many of the projects um, are really engaging with structures, um, both social, um, institutional, physical structures, um, and thinking about how we can remake those uh, to better serve us, right? We made them in the first place, we can remake them into new things, which I'm finding um, optimistic and hopeful. Uh, all right, we've got another three minutes um, before our next. Uh, so everybody take a moment to stare off into space and give your eyes a break from screens. Okay, and it's 1115. So we will jump to our next presentation. Adrian, are you ready? Do you want to introduce it? Or should I just play your video? Uh, yeah, I think I'll let the video introduce and then we can have a nice chat afterwards. Okay, here we go. Oh, wait, hold on. I got to share my screen. So many things to keep track of. Uh, Hello, my name is Adrian Mester. I'm graduating with a BCSA degree with concentrations in computer science and music technology. Over the course of these past two quarantine semesters, I've been looking to understand and capture the mentalities of gun carrying persons. The, uh, the result of this curiosity is captured in my game, Concealment. The conflict between gun rights and gun control groups is the norm for our modern world. On one side, gun rights organizations are entrenched in their beliefs, while on the other, gun control groups are struggling to gain a unified front. 
I was curious to what beliefs and messaging were occurring on the side of the gun rights organizations. What aspects of their beliefs made them so impenetrable? Can we learn to speak their language and work from their perspective? The game Concealment is a presentation of the fruits from this pursuit. What I have learned about the framing of gun owners and the world around them needs to be made understandable for those on all sides. For those who are considering a firearm, I do not want to convince them by slamming them with gun control propaganda. I would prefer to use gun rights messaging and show them how this messaging contains flaws. I hope to address the cracks in the gun rights belief system and expose the root issues beneath this whole debate. At the moment, Concealment is a short text adventure game with a play time of approximately 30 minutes. The game follows the perspective of a father named Jerry McFarrow. The player joins Jerry on the eve of his classes for a concealed carry license, following him through several days as he learns to use his firearm and ultimately using it on the final day. A key focus in the gameplay is how carrying a firearm can alter one's thought process. The ability to use the firearm to amplify the stakes of a social situation is a powerful aspect of the tool. This omnipresence is a key in representing the gun carrier's psyche. Multiple endings are possible in the game. Any ending due to a conflict refers to news articles that are relative to the event that the player acted out. While the neutral ending has the player lectured on the mental pressures of gun carrying, um, how they managed to get through the different uh, conflicts within the day, but regardless felt pressured by them. Interspersed within the story are quotes and messages taken from gun carriers, either woven into the lines of characters or utilized as key talking points when presenting these endings. This directly transmits the messaging to the player. At the time of this presentation, I've sent out the second prototype of concealment for playtesting and feedback. The purpose of this feedback is to see how players are perceiving the narrative and messaging. There is a fine transparency I'm trying to reach in the game's message, with the narrative serving as a vehicle to, to deliver this. While the target audience for the uh, game is currently white adult males from age 17 to 24, I'm also curious to see how those outside of the audience are receiving this game, this topic. Uh, those who perhaps are not from the US, I'm curious to see how they, uh, how, how they perceive this um, re representation of messaging, see if it aligns with their preconceptions. Any amount of feedback is extremely useful to me. And with that in mind, I've sent out copies of the game across multiple online channels, both including the, the target audience and not. Uh, and I'm inquiring the players about their experience with the subject matter and their impression of the game afterwards through pre and post uh, play questionnaires. With this feedback, I have a handful of decisions uh, in what direction I can move in. The first is that I continue to work on concealment. I can utilize the feedback to alter aspects of the story, to find different focuses that players found more intriguing, to cut out content that they felt was distracting. Um, while in another direction, I can make a new game. The uh, text adventure base is a very effective one for building on top of the characters, the setting, the events that have been written out can be incorporated with additional mechanics. The ability to control the firearm is one that I'm extremely interested in as the use of a firearm in a, a, social, a social situation along with having to speak is a very powerful uh, event to represent or in the current narrative context, it's a bit harder for a player to feel like they're holding the gun and pointing at somebody while talking. Overall, concealment is the start of my career in transformational game designs. Uh, I'm interested in further pursuing this style of game as it is one that allows me to 
work with a medium that I in, enjoy wholeheartedly and be able to take messaging that I want to impart on people and put it inside of a consumable medium. I see concealment as an excellent start on this journey. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you decided on the, the combination of content and format for this. Like what prompted you to make a text-based game that talked about the experience of guns? Oh, of course. Um, I kind of started from the perspective of guns. Um, strictly speaking, um, I was unsure of the exact format of the game, but I knew that I wanted to start by researching into um, the guns conflict, um, seeing what people are discussing, arguing about, and what aspects of uh, gun control and gun rights groups uh, comes out in their in their pr propaganda, in their focuses. And one that I had found interesting during studying uh, was uh, a talk about the, the people that are acquiring these licenses, the, the individuals uh, underneath these larger forces that are uh, either acquiring guns or imposing them. And what are their stories? What uh, at a societal level at a social level, um, does having a gun uh, re re reflect for a person, their beliefs, their interactions? And um, one key book, um, I think it was Good Guys with Guns, um, was a very, uh, a very impactful one and directed me towards this interest in the individual social aspect of gun carrying as a re reporter effectively just went through the entire process of acquiring a license while interviewing individual holders and getting a series of stories that cover, um, while different in kind of like the, the, the presentation of, of stories, different interactions, they all follow this, this aligning narrative. And in the end, um, convey this idea of social behavior, this, this idea of being uh, vulnerable in a, a social context and how you deal with the fact that you may feel vulnerable and how do you avoid feeling vulnerable in, in, in a social context. And that, and that um, central point of society and guns being a, a tool for the social self mm. uh, was where I went towards a text adventure as originally I was 100% uh, convinced that I would need to have some mechanic that involved using the gun. But more often when it came to these stories, what was interesting and impactful was the social. So the gun wasn't being used or it, the, the, the focus in the stories wasn't how the gun was being pointed and fired. It was how the gun was being used as a social tool. And that, and, and the focus on, um, one-on-one -on -one interactions and social events was what led me to want to strip down just to a text adventure base. So all, all that the player could focus on was what all the um, gun carriers were focusing on in their stories. Totally interesting. Um, and also so striking um, that it foregrounds the necessity of the social self, as you mentioned, right? Like in how, how that self is altered or affected by the tools at hand. Um, and I wonder if there's, it'll be interesting to hear sort of what kind of international feedback you get from that. Cause I think you are right that, that getting um, responses both from US people for whom this is, you know, feels like the norm in a lot of ways um, and hearing from, from other people for whom, you know, this is not a daily an everyday kind of experience. Um, yeah, really interesting. So um, yeah, what would you say are um, the top two skill sets you 
developed, that you built, that you expanded on in the process of doing this project? Hmm. I think one of them was in refining my own design process. As I was going through with this, I was being exposed to a lot of courses that were discussing a design pr process with educational intent in mind, namely transracial game design and educational game design. And with both of those, I began to understand a more flexible method of design, which uh, I mean, at the uh, outset of this project, I was quite rigid with my own pre-planning, but being able to um, kind of see this as a series of questions I'm asking and answering with my d d design um, has, has helped me kind of keep a, a better focus on the core message of the game while still being able to develop and pursue um, different a a aspects of it. Uh, namely kind of, as I was developing the, the narrative and pointing to different a aspects of it, I was noticing um, a lot more gaps and needing to figure out personally what it was like, uh, kind of following in the footsteps of what I, I read to find that direct me messaging and dig through different files and having that ability to um, open up my design pr process a, a bit more and have a fluid m movement between this research development and um, direct creation and design was one that I enjoy a lot, as well as um, kind of the playtesting social a aspect, being able to get more skills with working with people in gathering their f feedback and um, finding that connection with my players and un understanding how to um, build up that network to communicate and iterate on my own uh, process was one that I also felt was extremely useful from this project. That's, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, we've had three games presented so far today, which is, you know, par for the course, a lot of, a lot of capstone projects are focused on games. Um, and the, but they're such different, you know, all the games are very different, but what all three of you have said is, is that balance between flexibility, being able to be responsive to different kinds of problems, to think about different kinds of solutions and balancing that against a structure, right? Having, having your boundaries and deadlines and requirements in mind um, and still being able to be flexible within that as being a really crucial skill. Um, so it's interesting to hear you say that as well. I guess that's at the heart of designing games is that you gotta, you gotta manage both of those at the same time. Excellent, thank you so much, Adrian, for sharing that with us. Uh, and now we will move on to summer. Hey, Summer. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> so um, yeah, you can share your screen if you need to, and it's all yours. Cool. All right, give me one sec. Can you see it or no? No, okay, excellent, hold on. <laughs> oh, I got a thumbs up from Rebecca though. Okay, wait, I'm trying it one more time. I could see it when you shared the screen. I don't know if it's popping up for Steph. What about now? It could, it could very well be me, that's why I'm not sure. Oh, there it is, I found it. It was just behind windows. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, then give me one second. All right, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Summer Schneller. Uh, I'm a BXA student doing my concentrations in uh, architecture and environmental and sustainability studies. Um, today I'm gonna to be presenting my capstone project. It's called Eco Grinds. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but first I wanna propose a scenario um, that maybe will help get people into the right gear for this. So you step foot in your favorite coffee shop, you order your usual, the barista whips it up, uh, you know, they grind it, they pack it, they extract it, you drink it, it's awesome, it's great, it's warm, it's exactly what you needed. But have you ever considered what happens like once you've left the shop with your coffee? That is a question that I've also wondered and uh, this whole research project is basically centered around that. 
So for some context, uh, the United States consumes 400 million cups of coffee daily. Uh, the average coffee drinker drinks uh, three cups per day. And because of that 400 million cups of coffee, 83 million tons of coffee waste is produced in a day. And the coffee waste is mostly just watery coffee grounds. Um, to put into perspective just how much uh, coffee that is, uh, this is the blue whale. It's the largest mammal that exists. Uh, and if you were to represent the amount of coffee grounds by weight in blue whales, you would have to get 415,000 blue whales to measure up to that many coffee grounds. So clearly uh, there's something going on here. And the ridiculous thing is that coffee itself is an organic material. So why is it ending up in landfills? That's my question. Um, and after doing research, it seems that most coffee shops seem to have the system of just throwing it in the trash. So after doing uh, some reading of some research papers, these are some just some of the purposes people have uh, figured out for coffee grounds, used coffee grounds. Um, there are a lot of benefits to coffee grounds. Number one is even though uh, they've been extracted already, there's it can be up to 48% of the caffeine remaining still in the grounds, meaning the caffeine can be used in uh, the cosmetics industry. Uh, uh, caffeine is used for decreasing swelling and increasing circulation to an area and reducing cellulite. In addition, nutrients-wise, there's a high number of amino acids. It's uh, nutrient-rich, it's full of nitrogen, it's mildly acidic, and it has plenty of natural oils in it. Um, all of those factors combined can contribute to a lot of different purposes. The three that I wanted to focus on for this project and didn't really get to focus on to the full extent are the three that are bold, plant fertilizer, skin exfoliant, and a biofuel. The biofuel was the, the process that I carried out the most. Um, the skin exfoliant I kind of put on the back burner and the plant fertilizer I started working on, but there were a lot of things I needed to figure out. So I'm just gonna walk, walk through my process work for figuring out these products. So this is the first trial, um, which was basically when COVID started. Uh, I had gone to the local coffee shop uh, where I was staying for that time period and asked them if they'd lend me some coffee grounds. And they ended up just handing me a four pound bag of coffee, uh, sopping wet, which was great though. I mean, that just proves the point that many coffee shops are not giving it away. Um, so what I did was I baked off the water so I had a low temperature in the oven. I poured them into coffee filters. I melted some paraffin wax candles that I found around the house. I poured them over and I let them cool and then that's how you, you had it. But it taught me a lot of things uh, off the bat, even just from making it. That number one, I need to mix the wax and the coffee grounds. I don't know why it didn't occur to me then, but I did. Uh, they need to be homogenous or else it's kind of defeating the whole point. Um, also that coffee when wet, it molds extremely quickly, which made it a little challenging if I didn't dehydrate uh, the, the coffee grounds immediately. And then the final thing is that um, the, uh, the, the, the coffee itself isn't uh, able to hold itself together. It needs the binder of the wax to do that for itself. So then I kind of wanted to try out that uh, gardening uh, concept. I wanted to uh, con create some sort of a product that when uh, used has seeds in it and when wet expands and starts growing seeds for your garden. Uh, that it's like an all-in-one comprehensive. The closest thing that exists on the market is um, these things called peat pots, but there's a large environmental um, challenge brought with peat pots because Peat, uh, places where peat is produced uh, hold up to a third of the world's soil carbon. And when harvested, it, it releases a large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which we all know we shouldn't be doing. So I found, after doing some research, a product called Coconut Coir. It's the husk of a coconut. Um, it's already a waste product as is, so it's not like it was going to be causing anyone any harm. Um, and the cool thing about it, if you see in the top right, is that when it's dense, um, it stays together, but when wet, it just expands like multiple times over. So you need only a little bit to go a long way. Didn't really stick together after I packed and dehydrated it. Um, I need to do more research, but the issue is there's not much precedent work going on in, in this specific product kind of idea. 
but um, I do intend to keep working on it because I think it'd be a really neat idea. Um, I want to quickly touch on the ethics of product development. I felt a lot of uh, struggle trying to figure out how to produce a product without adding any more to an already ethically challenging uh, agricultural situation. Um, coffee itself is a hard product to be created ethically due to the amount of hands it passes through and due to the controversy with fair trade and that it hasn't really demonstrated a large uh, increase in economies for the people who are growing it. Uh, I also struggled a little bit with finding, I wanted to use organics to reduce the amount of chemicals uh, that I would be contributing to the, the globe. Uh, what I did find though, is that beeswax, which is the wax that I train transitioned to after this first test, is so hard to find as an organic material because bees will just fly wherever they please. And so if there's any non-organic farms in your 50 mile radius, wherever your bees hang out, then that's, that's a done deal. You're already lost the organic title. So those are some things in mind. I wanted to really be conscious of the ethics involved and try to make this as green and eco-friendly as I could. So for the final testing, I ran a few trials with different ratios of coffee grounds and beeswax. Um, one with like a higher concentration of coffee grounds and one with a higher concentration of beeswax um, where I melted it and I combined it, slowly incorporated the grounds into the wax and I let it cool in a number of different shapes and uh, methods. I really like the idea of using a coffee filter because it does burn, but I was also considering letting it just um, be cast in a mold that was removed after it and it was just a solid puck, which worked, but yeah, for cleanliness sake and coherency, it was actually really nice to have the filter. Um, so yeah, I, I learned a couple of things and I took a little video um, of the process, which is here. On the left is the lower concentration beeswax. So it's about a 50-50 ratio of, of weight uh, between coffee grounds and beeswax. On the right has a lot more beeswax in it and it's super smoky and it dripped a bunch. It made a mess in my grill, it was not the best. And then on the right, you can see the um, a different shape that I used, which was a square shape. I was curious if it would burn differently, but this was definitely helpful. Um, and I did end up sticking with a closer to the 50-50 ratio between coffee grounds and um, these wax. It seemed to work the best for what I needed. And, and actually I was shocked to find out they burned for like more than 20 minutes each, even, even though that was like my first time trying it. So that, that, that gave me like, hope for it working out. So um, all in all, uh, th these are a couple pictures I took at the end of the final product. Uh, you can see here, they are just a package of coffee grounds and beeswax in a coffee filter. Um, all of the part of the product is flammable. So any all of it will go up in flames. So you can light it kind of wherever you please and it'll all go up in flames. Um, here's a couple more pictures. Um, I really wanted to focus on it being like an eco-conscious option for you and, and your, your family and your home. Um, and I guess a few things that I definitely wanna continue work on this. Um, the next step would be to start talking with some local coffee shops now that COVID's kind of dialing itself down and see how we can work out some sort of a partnership where I can get grounds from them, produce products and have them resell it. Um, COVID definitely put a damper on my intentions and goals, but I'm really happy with the way everything came out. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot of potential for moving forward. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, thanks Summer. Um, I, I have um, one really obvious question, which is what does it smell like when it burns? It smells great. Yeah, it smells like roasted coffee grounds and beeswax. It's pretty much exactly what you think. Nice. nice. So, you know, that can't is... complain. Could be much worse. That's that's a lot better than a lot of fire starter briquette kind of things. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Um, so I'm wondering also, um, you know, sort of <laughs> more in depth, um, you know, I thought that it was I'm, I'm really glad that you spent a while sort of thinking through the ethical implications of this as well, and especially around coffee, as you mentioned, that it, that it is, um, it's a hard topic. It's a, it's a product that has a lot of um, 
problems attached to it. Um, and do you think that, um, I'm trying to think of how to frame this. Do you think that, I don't know. Sorry, it's it's been a long three hours. Um, we're almost there. Let me take it back a minute. Let me take it back a minute. Um, do you think that in addition to the ecological benefits, right, the sustainability benefits of this, um, that there would also be a way of does this does this tie people to their communities more? Is there more of a community building or community supporting? Like I, I'm thinking about like you had to make contacts with the coffee shop, probably had to find some beekeepers that you could talk to. Um, I mean, do you think that that is an essential part of thinking about how to reuse these this waste? Yeah, um, especially the coffee shops concept. Coffee shops are a, a business model that works on fine margins, fine lines. So um, in any way that you can help them, they would benefit almost without doing nearly anything because all they're doing is producing grounds anyways. So it benefits them, it benefits us. We would brand their materials on our products so that you understand that the grounds that you were literally using for your products came from a local coffee shop. So in that sense, the money is coming back to the coffee shop, which is then going back to the farmers of the beans and the other materials and products required to make these goods. So definitely, I'm really conscious about community engagement. I think that this is an awesome tool for getting uh, communities to really get closer, hone in on their relationships with their local businesses. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the seed pot idea, if you're able to, to do more with that, like that's such a great opportunity to personalize that, right? To like, here's what works for your climate zone. Here are the seeds already packed in there. Um, you know, take a, take a little bit of Pittsburgh back to wherever <laughs> you're going um, and plant these. Um, excellent, well, thank you so much. This was, I'm excited to see where you go with this. Yeah. Thank you for presenting. All Thanks. right. Um, and to wrap us up this morning, Christian. Hello. Hello. All right. I will hand it over to you. You can share your screen or, or do whatever you need. Yep. Should be up. All right. Well, hello. Um, my name is Christian. Uh, I study cognitive science and art and also human computer interaction. Um, the project is called Pith, uh, and I did it along with Sydney uh, Zun, who is a student in co uh, computer science. Uh, and it was mentored by Professor Hirokazu Shirado from uh, HCI. Um, so the sort of catalyst for this project, where it started, uh, it was about a year ago, maybe a little more. Uh, Sydney and I were talking about democracy and anarchy and all sorts of uh, sort of different systems of government governance or not governance. And we realized that direct democracy is a pretty cool system, but it really can exist at a large scale. There's sort of a fundamental uh, problem when it comes to the physicality of the world. We can't all meet together to discuss something or vote on it, something and so on. And even if we could, there's a challenge. Uh, and that is that we can't have a discussion at a large scale. We can have a discussion with maybe five other people. We can have a discussion with everyone at CMU or everyone in Pittsburgh or everyone in Pennsylvania. It goes on. So there's sort of this challenge here. And we thought, well, maybe this is something to start thinking about. How could we design a system that uh, sort of facilitates these large scale discussions in a digital way? Because when you uh, are working digitally, these traditional constraints of uh, distance and, and sort of geography are sort of disappeared to some degree at least. So our approach is this, basically to take a large group of people, split them down into these smaller groups where you can have a natural discussion, uh, maybe you know three to 10 people, and then to produce some kind of a summary, some sort of document, some record of that discussion and join those together to get uh, a kind of an approximation for what that entire discussion uh, would be like. Um, so it's breaking everybody down into these sort of atomic units of discussion and then building everything back up in this sort of cycle here. 
So what I'm going to focus on here uh, and what we sort of focused on is the small discussion space because really this is kind of where it starts. Uh, you know, we can only sort of work with smaller groups, but uh, ideally it would be larger groups. But this is sort of a, if, if we get the small discussion space right, then uh, if we can get the large discussion space, uh, eventually it should work better. So really what we were asking here is what we can learn from existing systems. There's a lot of great chats out there like Discord, Slack, uh, messages and so on, but there's a lot that we can improve on uh, and asking the question of where we can improve on, what's lacking. So there's two things I'm gonna talk about here. The first is uh, this problem that we ran into of summarization. How can we effectively summarize the discussion fairly and, and uh, efficiently? And the second is that place for people to discuss. Uh, what does that look like? What's it like to interact with it? And I'll walk through a, sort of a very specific smaller design problem that we encountered. So the first thing is this organizational system. And this we worked on uh, last fall and also this spring. Um, and it turns out that there's two sort of ways to do this. Um, if you wanna create some way to create a summary that you, know, you can then join back later with a whole bunch of other summaries of the same kind, uh, you sort of have the choice between creating a kind of a hierarchy of ideas. So, you know, this is sort of how a lot of things get structured. It's like a tree structure where you have like parents and children, uh, you know, maybe you have animals and then you have cats and dogs and then further break it down like that. Or you have more of an associative network where everything is sort of this like little node which has links to other things around it. It's much more free form and less structured. So the first approach we took because this is something that we saw worked a lot in other systems was this uh, hierarchical approach. So thinking about a sort of a nested list where everything is a grandparent or a parent or a child and, and it can sort of go as deep as you want it to go. So we implemented this and we tested it out but it turned out that there were a lot of problems with it. Uh, it was really hard to view at these sort of different resolutions. You could only see a very specific section of that tree at a time. And it's very hard to sort of traverse the tree and move around and have a sense of where you are. So with this in mind, we kind of moved in a different direction, thinking about breaking this up into two pieces, uh, a sort of a, a list, which is sort of a fast paced place where you can pin things and an idea map, which is really for synthesis and deeply mapping these relationships um, in, without a hierarchy. Um, so this is sort of what that looks like in the end. It's, uh, this is the full interface. You start on the left with sort of like this free flowing chat where ideas just sort of pop off quickly. You move those ideas through a sort of a pinning action into a summary. So, you know, if I see something I like, I would pin it into the summary there. And this just sort of is a place to gather the, the, the interesting things that come up. And then finally, on the far right, there's the board, which is the, the place for deep synthesis where I can sort of create these units and, and find the mappings between them. The idea being that the, the board is a place that everyone who's discussing can see. It's this sort of common boundary object. So the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, a small problem we encountered in the discussion space itself. Um, and that is creating a listening mechanism. So this is a problem that happens a lot in sort of normal everyday conversation, but especially on uh, digital conversations. You know, somebody might say something and it might be ignored or just sort of forgotten because the chat's moving so fast. Uh, but it may be that their contribution is something they want people to acknowledge. Um, we were looking at ways for perhaps the system itself to try and help this. Um, often, you know, this a simple solution to this might be to make sure that you have a group of people who are really conscious of this and are trying to sort of make sure that this doesn't happen, but that can't always happen, um, especially at, at sort of different scales with strangers. So we're looking at ways to sort of address this problem from a systems perspective. So our pr process here was uh, three iterations of designing and then building and then testing it out uh, with uh, some, some users. So in our first case, we basically didn't introduce anything. We just sort of had this chat by default, just see what would happen. And pretty much immediately this, this came up. Somebody would make a contribution and it was sort of ignored. Um, here's a quote from one of our participants where they say, I felt like none of my suggestions were being listened to and I wanted to show that I had some suggestions, you know? 
So we started by thinking about this sort of uh, through a mechanism called a flare, which is like a, a little tag you can apply to your, to your message um, from this kind of short set of question, suggestion, or meta. So when I send, send a suggestion, I can tag it as a suggestion and it appears there in the chat. It sort of highlights the message and makes it clear what the intent is. Um, and when this, this work, this was introduced, it sort of worked in the sense that it creates this culture of flaring where people would add flares to their posts. Um, but unfortunately it didn't really change people's feelings of being heard. Uh, they were still being skipped over uh, sometimes and, and sort of in an unsatisfying way. So then we thought, Perhaps we can, in, we can sort of leverage our other parts of the system, such as the uh, summary to help us with that. So then what we would do is we um, made it so that when you used a flare that pinned your message to the summary, right? And this introduces two main challenges for users of the system. The first is that the summary is a place that has to be kept clean if you want it to be used effectively, right? You want the summary to be sort of a a list of all the interesting things that came up in the conversation. So if every time you use a flare, the message gets added, it, it starts to get cluttered. The second challenge is who pins and unpins is shown in the chat. So if I unpin something, it says, you know, my nickname unpinned the thing. The result is that people have to acknowledge flared contributions because if they don't and they just unpin something without acknowledging it first, uh, they look rude, right? Because it's, you know, they're, they're sort of just taking away your contribution and, and not even talking about it. So in an, because people don't want to feel rude, they acknowledge the contribution. So here's a little example of that from one of our chats. Yeah, you see these people use uh, flares here and they, these messages are pinned off on the right side of the screen there. You can't see it, but they're there. And then sure enough, other people will come and they'll respond. They'll, they'll reply to these messages and acknowledge them by either adding on or agreeing, or sometimes they would disagree, but they didn't, they didn't ignore it is the point. They would always respond to it, which is what we were going for. So we were able to sort of have this, have this effect, uh, change the social dynamics of the system. So the, the two sort of insights that I pull from these smaller uh, parts of what we did uh, would be basically in the case of, of organization summarization, adding a summary to a chat is a really effective way of making it easier to follow while you're in the chat, but also after, um, you know, we measured sort of what would happen without the summary. And it seemed like the summary was really adding something to people's experience of using this. And, you know, at a sort of a higher level, this sort of tells me that the basic text chat is not something that's set in stone and there's a lot of room to grow. There's a lot that we can add to it to make it a more interesting place to, to spend time and, and, to perhaps be more productive or, or effective, however we want to measure that. And then finally, um, when it comes to the sort of social dynam dynamics, these are things that we can change. Um, in the case of the listening mechanic, we, we applied some changes to the system and it improved the dynamics of the people between the, the dynamics between the people that ended up using it. Um, and, you know, I think this is particularly interesting um, because we often look at this from the other way, which is that, uh, you know, these social systems like social media, they're, they're causing a lot of uh, sort of bad things to social dynamics. So they're causing a lot of uh, grief, but this sort of shows that we can actually apply changes and it can benefit people in the other direction. It can actually help, help sort of people listen to others better or, or whatever it may be. So it's sort of a design problem that we just need to, to figure out, I guess, and, and make sure that, uh, it's actually something that we want to solve because if we can, if we look at it, we can actually solve it. So that is the presentation. Yeah. Questions. Thanks, Christian. Uh, I, I want to use this right now in my classes because, yeah, I think that the introduction of a summary is such a fantastic idea and that pinned board, right, where you can really highlight the, the, the important decisions or concepts that you've come to, um, that's, that's really exciting. And I think you're right that, that thinking about, you know, just because we've had an established structure for how we have online discussions, 
um, doesn't mean that there aren't improvements there. And the, the thought that, you know, you can use um, the social engineering built into technology for good. Again, I'm very hopeful. You all are making me so hopeful for the future. <laughs> so um, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna, we're gonna wrap. Is there anything you wanna leave us with on this? Are you, is this going to be something that you're continuing to, to work on? Uh, yeah, I think we will. Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of, we sort of built this, this, this uh, maybe you could call it a platform, but it's more of like a canvas, I guess, that we can mm -hmm. use to sort of play with different uh, things that we want to introduce. You know, the summary was just one of them. And, and so is this listening mechanic, but there's a lot of other stuff that we've just sort of played with and, and want to get a feel for uh, small changes that we make to sort of this um, already kind of established chat system that can perhaps be, uh, yeah, perhaps can be a, a bit of an improvement, you know? Yeah, no, I think these are huge improvements. They're not just bits. So um, thank you for presenting that um, and sharing that. And you are our last of the morning. So thanks for wrapping it up for us. Um, anyone watching on the live stream, we will be back at three Eastern with the rest of our presentations. Thanks.